Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we'll get started with our meeting, beginning with a lot of meeting. But um, uh, as uh, Regent Perez just said uh, in the meeting before, we just had a phenomenal exchange uh, that was kicked off and led by Dr. Tristan Denley um, that after two months of not being together was a great uh, way to get back engaged. And we appreciate uh, him and the rest of the staff for all the effort and the work that they've put forth. Um, and uh, you know, all members, just remember that we are being streamed live, so you'll need to turn your microphone on when you're uh, recognized and speak directly into the microphone so our virtual audience can, uh, can hear you. So Commissioner Reed, please call the meeting to order, ma'am. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to call the lot of meeting to order. Uh, Rhonda, will you call the roll? Dr. Reed? Here. Regent David? Here. Regent Ewing? Here. Senator Fields? Here. Regent Finley? Here. Ms. Calder? Present. Regent Levy? Here. Regent Lombrey? Here. Regent May? Here. Regent McDonald? Here. Representative Mincy? Here. Regent Near? Regent Perez? Here. Regent Pryor? Here. Regent Seal? Here. Regent Solomon? Here. Regent Sterling? Here. Regent Temple? Here. Regent Wells? Wow. Here. Mr. John Williams? And Regent Williams Brown? Here. You have 17, which does represent a quorum. Thank you so much, Rhonda. I appreciate that. Aaron, welcome. Great to see you. Um, okay, so we will now move to item three, public comments. Are there any public comments? No, no, no public comments. Hearing none, we'll move to item four. Members, you've received a copy of the minutes for the April 27, 2022 meeting. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion. Motion by Regent Temple. Is there a second? Second by Regent Meir. Double second with Regent Seal as well. Any discussion? Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Uh, now item five, the consent agenda. Dr. Butte, please proceed. Certainly. Good morning, members. I'd like to welcome Robin Lively uh, to the table along with Rhonda Britavo. Li Robin is our senior attorney, so many of you work with her and know her, but wanted to make sure that we welcomed her. I'd also like to give a shout out to Shane and Ozzy with our LASPA team. They're usually back at the office doing LASPA things, but today they are uh, came over so that we could all understand the admission standards such that we can begin to prepare tools for counselors and parents and students. So welcome to them. Your first consent agenda item is approval of final rulemaking. And this is to accept the and codify into rule the interest for principal protection and earnings enhancements funds for the 2021 calendar year. And the 2021 is not an error. This is done for the past tax year. These interest rates are set by the treasurer and this is approval of final rule. The second consent agenda item is initial rulemaking. And this is to uh, implement acts of the legislature. And this act which allows now for transferring from a person that has a start saving account to a start K-12 account, it allows for transfer without penalty. Uh, we thank Senator Foyle for sponsoring this. Our uh, LASFA start savings team member staff get plenty of public comments about the desire to be able to do this. So we thank the treasurer for supporting it and our regent, I mean, sorry, Senator Foyle and the legislature for passing it. Since this started, uh, the month of August isn't even complete yet. We've had 23 transfers already from start and 20 new start K-12 accounts opened in order to receive those transfers and the month is not even over. So this is initial rulemaking. The LASFA Advisory Board has reviewed both of these consent agenda items and they do recommend approval. Thank you, Dr. Butte. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Uh, motion by Regent Perez, second by Regent Weil. Um, any discussion? Any questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion passes. 
Is there anything else to come before the LADA group today? No other business. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved by Regent uh, McDonald, second by Regent Finley, uh, and we are adjourned. Thank you. So now we'll move into our committee meetings. First up is the audit committee. Regent Seal, please call your committee to order, sir. Thank you, sir. I would like to call the committee to order and ask Ms. Bourgeois to, uh, once she gets set up, we'll ask her to call the order. <laughs> Thank you, Regent Seal. Um, Chair Seal? Here. Um, Vice Chair Perez? Here. Uh, Regent Ewing? Here. Regent Solomon? Here. Regent Wild? Here. Regent Williams Brown? Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. We will now move to item uh, three, the external assessment report would you please present yes sir thank you Regent seal item three on the report is the external assessment report review to ensure compliance with internal audit standards the Board of Regents is required to undergo an independent internal I'm sorry independent external assessment every five years as part of the overall quality assurance and improvement program Regents contracted with the accounting firm Horn to conduct this assessment, which was completed in June. Horn's overall opinion is that the Board of Regents generally conforms with the standards and the IIA's code of ethics. The rating generally conforms is the highest rating an internal audit activity can receive uh, or, or achieve on the external assessment review. This achievement places Regents in compliance with internal audit standards, fully in compliance with internal auditing standards and the requirements from Act 314 of the 2015 legislative session. In the audit world, the, uh, the A plus you get is generally conforms. That's as good as it gets. Generally conforms. Uh, but uh, it is the highest uh, evaluation given. And so uh, that's recognition that the audit program uh, is uh, successful and complete. And so I'm, uh, I'm very proud of the audit team and uh, would like uh, to express appreciation to uh, to Ms. Bourgeois and to the Postal Weight uh, team that has uh, worked with us all the way through. Um, this, is, uh, this is the top of the stack of credentials that an audit program can have, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something we should all take some pleasure in. So uh, I'd like to commend the staff, and I appreciate a round of applause for them. And so uh, now uh, I'd like to see if there is a motion to accept this report. Motion's been made. Is there a second? second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. <coughs> the, uh, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the next item, item four, is the internal audit presentation. We have uh, Kristen Burke and Laura Swallow from Postal Way to Netterville. We invite them to proceed. Thank you, Regent Seal. I'll begin with going over our um, fiscal year 2022 contract update. Um, the last audit that was in our fiscal year 2022 audit plan was of the loss of a Go Grant program. The scope of our audit included certain processes of the program, including the Go Grant packaging policy assessment, award system, logical security, residential compliance of GoGrant recipients, record retention, the LOSFA audit risk assessment and audit processes, um, and allocation disbursements and refund processing. 
The procedures that we performed included obtaining any documented policies and procedures. We also conducted interviews and performed walkthroughs to gain an understanding of the key processes associated with the program. We also assessed losses audit processes related to applicable program components as well. During the interviews and walkthroughs that our team performed, we identified certain controls that were in place that were designed to mitigate certain risks associated with the GoGrant program processes. And these included system edit controls that were on certain high-risk data fields in the award system, which is utilized for processing GoGrant payments, the payment requests that have come through from the eligible institutions. These edit controls prevented internal users from making any changes to the data independently that is independently submitted to determine the GoGrant eligibility. These controls were designed to increase data integrity in the system and they reduced the risk of human error and intentional or intentional manipulation of the data. Additionally, there's risk-based audits that are performed annually on a sample basis related to institutional compliance with the framework. The audits included assessments of the eligibility determinations made and overall processes for alignment with program regulations, including those of the packaging policy requirements and residential compliance. Additionally, as part of these audits, the billings and disbursements made by the institutions were reviewed for accuracy on a sample basis. This audit as a whole, this audit process as a whole served as a detective and corrective control and was designed to reduce the risk of overall overpayments made by the program. Based on the procedures we performed, there were no reportable observations that were identified that were assessed to be within our risk ratings that we utilize in our procedures. Our team met with the LOSFA management team to discuss our results, and we issued our final report in June of 2022. Um, Thank you to the LOSFA management team for their cooperation during our audit process. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you guys may have related to the GoGrant audit results and performance of the audit. Are there uh, any questions on, the, uh, on this audit report? Um, uh, hearing none then, um, uh, if you would, uh, approve the uh, report, uh, I'll, I'd request a motion, please. Motion to uh, receive the report and approve it. Uh, is there a second? Second. And a, a second. Uh, all in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. All right, that report is received. The uh, next item is the uh, update of the uh, 2023 contract for um, our external auditor. And uh, Laura, would you present that, please? Thank you. The first thing that we want to cover is our assessment of the independence of the internal audit team. Standard 1100 of the Institute of Internal Auditors, International Standards for the Professional Practice of Internal Auditing, which we refer to as the standards, states that internal audit must be independent and internal auditors must be obje objective in performing their work. And you can think of independence as the freedom from conditions that threaten the ability of internal audit to carry out its responsibilities in an unbiased manner, which is typically going to be achieved when internal audit has direct and unrestricted access to senior management and the board. Whereas objectivity is an unbiased mental attitude that allows internal auditors to perform their engagements in such a manner that they believe their work product, that they believe in their work product and that no quality compromises are made. So PNN has assessed our independence in serving in the outsourced internal audit function for the Board of Regents. Based on our assessment, no threats or impairments to our independence or objectivity as defined by the standards were identified. And just a little bit of background on this. This is something that historically we've done internally on a more informal basis, but one of the best practice recommendations that was included in uh, the external assessment review was to do this um, and present it to the audit committee. So that's why we've included it today. And how often should this 
uh, independence assessment be conducted? Annually. Thank you. Does that require a motion? No. No, sir. All right, so our next topic is the review of the internal audit charter for uh, uh, 2023. Yes. So an internal audit charter is required under the IAA standards and Act 314, uh, which required the establishment of internal audit for regents, also requires that that internal audit function adhere to the IAA standards. An internal audit charter is a formal document that defines internal audit's purpose, authority, responsibility, and position within the organization. The Board of Regents Internal Audit Charter requires annual review and approval, which was last completed in June of 2021. So we have completed an internal review, and at this point in time, we're not recommending any updates or changes to the current Internal Audit Charter. And I'll also add that when the charter was developed, we used the IIA's model internal audit charter as the foundation for the charter, which helps ensure that all of the mandatory elements as required by the IIA are included within the charter. And uh, remind us what the IIA is, please. The IIA is the Institute of Internal Auditors, which is the, the global uh, professional body and standard setting for internal auditing. And so the standard for the internal audit charter is from their, their uh, publication, is that right? That's correct. And how frequently should this audit charter be reviewed? This should uh, be reviewed on an annual basis. And uh, does, the, uh, does this review require a motion? It does. All right. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to accept this internal audit review as provided by Postal Way to Netterville. Motion has been made. Is there a second? And uh, motion has been made and seconded. Uh, is there objection to the motion? Without objection, then that motion is adopted. Please proceed to the next item. Thank you. The last topic that we'll cover is the annual internal audit risk assessment. The risk assessment is a tool that we use as internal audit to identify the areas that we'll be performing audit procedures in. And again, this is something that is uh, included in the IAA standards basically um, with a responsibility again to make sure that the audits that are completed are um, identified based on risk to the organization. And so for the current year risk assessment, we interviewed key personnel uh, across management senior management and the board to gain an understanding of their perceptions on risk uh, for the Board of Regents, LOSFA, and LUMCON. We've had about 10 interviews that, that we've used um, to um, complete this process. And so using the results of those um, interviews, we've developed a preliminary audit plan that we'll present to the Audit Committee for approval today. The first audit that we have on our proposed audit plan is an audit of LUMCON information technology. You may recall that this audit was initially included on the fiscal year 22 uh, approved audit plan and through some, some conversations and recommendations, this was pushed back to allow for an audit of a different area in fiscal year 22. And so with that, um, with that pushback, this is the first audit that we have started as part of fiscal year 23. Um, we began those procedures in July. And so the other auditable areas that we propose for this year include um, La Carte purchasing card activity and some background information on this particular area. So the state La Carte policy requires that agencies that have an internal audit function as they complete their internal audit risk assessment, they should consider purchasing card activity as part of that risk assessment process. And if the purchasing card activity is identified to be high risk, then in assessing all of the other high risk areas, the La Carte activity should be included in that assessment. Furthermore, the policy also recommends or encourages that no less than once every three, three years an audit of uh, the purchasing card activity is completed. And so the first audit that we completed when we were initially contracted with Regents in 2018 was of the purchasing card activity. Uh, that was in, again, 2018. 
we identified some moderate and low risk observations that we vetted through follow up audit procedures in February of 2020. And at that point in time, all of the management action plans from that audit had been substantially remediated. However, as part of the, the LACAR policy, we continue to look at that activity on an annual basis um, for consideration within the audit plan. And as you can imagine, during the COVID years, there weren't a lot of uh, transactions being processed through LACART, but um, as some of the restrictions are being lifted and, and we're seeing more LACART activity, we would recommend an audit of that area again this year. And then the last area that we've got uh, included in the plan is actually a placeholder. And so through our conversations, we've identified uh, some risk areas, but we also know that there are uh, moving parts and pieces across the board. And so rather than lock in to that last area now, we actually recommend waiting until we complete the first two audits on the plan and then reassessing risk in conjunction with management and the audit committee to identify the last area that would be audited. This is the first year you've uh, recommended a placeholder in the audit schedule, is that right? I think a couple of years ago we did when we did the audit of um, Regents IT security and that was because we weren't sure the extent of that audit and we wanted to make sure that we had sufficient resources devoted to that audit. Members. Um as uh, chair, I recommend to you the uh, reapproval of the internal audit charter and the approval of the internal audit plan for 2023 and would receive a motion for that. All right, a motion has been made. Is there a second? Motion, motion is made and seconded. Um, all in favor signify by aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The motion carries. Is there any other business to come before the audit committee? Uh, hearing none, uh, I want to thank you again for the outstanding uh, report on uh, the, uh, the credentialing of our audit program and tell you that it's a pleasure to work with you and I appreciate the consideration you give to me every month in our discussions. Thank you. One more thing. We also have to point out your leadership and, and guidance in helping us through this five-year process here. Um, so we also want to thank you as well for your support um, for for me and for PNN as well. Yeah. I would you. say I would say an effective internal audit function can't happen with internal audit alone. It really is a partnership between uh, the audit committee and uh, management of the organization, and so it's the the collective of everybody working together that allowed us to achieve this result. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. So <clears throat> as uh, as Kristen and Laura sat up there, I really had to look under their name tag because I'm like, uh, you know, that's right, they do not work for the Board of Regents, but it has been a while since they've been with us. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for generally, is it gen generally conforms. Y'all gotta work on a more exciting high-end name than that, right? Um, so next up is Facilities and Property Committee. Regent Mayor, please call your committee to order, sir. I'd like to call the Facilities and Property Committee to order. Uh, Mr. Herring, please call the roll. Yes, sir. Chair Mayor. Present. Vice Chair Levy. Here. Regent Ewing. Here. Regent McDonald. Here. Regent Weil. Here. Regent Lobre. Here. Supervisor Tarver. Here. Supervisor Werner. Here. UL System Representative. LCTCS representative. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Herring. Uh, we would like to move to agenda item three, the consent agenda. Um, Mr. Herring, could you please proceed? Yes, sir. The consent agenda uh, this month contains 14 small capital projects and two third party projects approved since the last time we met. I'd be happy to answer any questions on anything, and if not, we uh, recommend approval of the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Herring. Um, you've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to approve the, all the projects on the consent agenda? So moved. I have a motion by Regent Weil. Second. Second by uh, Ms. Werner. Uh, any discussion or any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? Motion passes. We'll move to uh, agenda item number four, the Act 959 project submitted by the 
Southern University System on behalf of Southern University A&M College. Yes, sir. Um, as a reminder, Act 959 of 2003 allows institutions to pursue capital projects outside the traditional capital outlay process um, with the construction costs up to $5 million, so long as the funding source is not um, derived from the capital outlay bill or major repairs or operating dollars. With that said, we received four projects um, submitted on behalf of Southern University's main campus here in Baton Rouge to construct um, or, or build four, four new items. Um, the first one is a global innovation and welcome center. The project cost on this one is $5 million. Um, this will be to serve uh, international students and provide a, um, a welcome location as folks come onto campus. The facility itself will be about 12,000 square feet and contain um, auditorium space, lecture uh, areas, as, as well as conference rooms. The second item is um, enclosing the walkways and courtyard adjacent to T.H. Harris Hall on campus. This is a $1.5 million project, and the idea is to enclose this space to provide an area for students to pursue individual and collaborative activities um, adjacent to this facility. The next item is an outdoor um, amphitheater or classroom lecture area. This will be a 1,500 uh, square, um, not square foot, 1,500 seating arrangement for students. The, the location for this has not been determined. Once an architect comes on board, they're going to work with the designer to select the most appropriate location on campus. And the final item is a new public safety building. The, the location of the current building in the heart of campus is going to be the site of the new um, School of Business that Southern uh, recently received funding for through the capital outlay process. So this project will move um, the police station to another location on campus. Um, all four of these projects are being funded with federal um, higher education relief fund dollars that were made available. Um, the, the projects will be complete by March of 2024 uh, as per the funding guidelines and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions on any of these. Are there any questions regarding these projects? If not, I'll, um, act, I'll ask for a motion to approve these four projects. Can we have a mo motion by Dr. Tara? Can I get a second? Second. Second by uh, Regent Weil. Uh, any discussion or questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? Ayes have it. We'll move on to agenda item five, which is other business. Um, Chris, you're going to give a report on some capital outlay visits, right? Yes, sir. I just wanted to give the board uh, an update and heads up that I've begun scheduling capital outlay visits. It's been a, two years or so since we've been able to get out and see the campuses uh, with a group of folks. So you'll be receiving an email from me with the list of dates. Um, over the next six weeks or so, uh, we'll be taking visits to all four systems. So I'll send you guys an invite, and if you have any questions, uh, by all means, let me know, and uh, I'd love to see you guys out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herring. I, I want to advise all the region members that, you know, these, these are good visits, especially the ones in your neighborhood and your region. Um, please partake in them. It, gets, it gives you a chance to, and outside your region also, but it gives you a chance to, to see what's going on at the, the various universities. And Chris does a good job lining things up ahead of time, so you, you'll know the dates ahead of time. Uh, is there any other business to come before the committee? I just have a question. Um, I second uh, what Regent Mir said about getting to the campuses. I got the opportunity as a chair in my first year to, to do that uh, with Chris. Uh, but also, Chris, not to, put, not to put a damper on all the great things that have been happening, but how much of a dent in uh, all of the, the, the stuff that needs to be done, uh, the, have we been able to put with this influx of cash, rough percentage-wise? I would say it's nominal. Um, with the backlog being the figure that it is, um, it's 50 million a year is hard to um, even maintain at the rate of deficiencies. You know, um, it's a never ending battle to, to try to make a dent in that. And, and at a rate of $50 million a year, it's, it's basically kind of plugging holes because each day almost something new pops up that may not even have been a priority last week. So um, I would say that the, the the percentage decrease at this point has been nominal. Hey, thank you. 
Any other business we come before the committee? Yes, sir, Regent McCoy. Uh, I missed a portion about the, the, the Global Innovation Center at, at Southern. Can I get a, a description of it again? Uh, and where is it going to be located at the, the campus, and what is it? Yes, sir. It's it, well, this will investment in their campus. It will be a uh, 12,000 square foot facility that's going to ha house um, Office of Sponsored Research, um, international students, and, and serve as a welcome center for folks coming on campus. Um, it, the facility itself will have a large auditorium area, conference rooms, meeting and lecture rooms um, to service a, a, a variety of activities. Uh, I believe they're working with the designer on this as well for the most appropriate location, but my understanding would be um, towards the entrance of campus. I was going to make that point that uh, over the hill as you come to the, the campus, that'd be a, you know, a great location, I think, to improve the, you know, it's good to have that, uh, that investment into that initial look on the campus, and I was glad to see that investment on your Agenda item. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Thorpe, yes. That's right. And uh, so it's been quite a, quite a task to get that done. It's right next door to the museum, and it overlooks the Mississippi River. It's a very strategic uh, location. And uh, welcome to give you a tour sometime. Thank you. Buying lunch. <laughs> I'd love to do that. Thank you, Dr. Tarver. Uh, any other business? If not, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion by Regent Levy. Second. Second by uh, Regent Lubre. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion passes. We're adjourned from uh, facilities and property. All right. So next up, moving right along, is the Academic and Student Affairs Committee. <laughs> Regent David, please call your meeting, meeting to order, sir. Sure, I'd love to call the Academic <laughs> <laughs> And it's on. Dr. Denley, can you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Regent David. Here. Regent Finley. Here. Regent Pryor. Here. Regent Solomon. Regent Sterling. Here. Regent Williams Brown. Here. Regent LeBray. Here. LCTCS representative. Here. LSU representative. Southern representative? Here. UL system representative? You have a quorum, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Let's jump to item number three, uh, Dr. Denley, of uh, the consent agenda. Yes, thank you. So we, we have a, a number of items on the consent agenda, some uh, routine terminations of some graduate certificates, and then some routine staff approvals of uh, some, some, uh, some creations of some undergraduate certificates, such as a, a cybersecurity certificate, uh, and then another in uh, ultrasound, uh, and then some, some renamings of, of various uh, degrees and, uh, and, uh, and, and educational units. So uh, staff recommends approval of those items on the consent agenda. Thank you, Dr. Denley. Uh, Y'all have heard the, the recommendation. Is there a motion to approve the items of the consent agenda? No motion. Motion from Regent Finley and a second from Regent Williams Brown. Um, any further discussion or questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes. All right, now moving on to the academic programs. Dr. Denley, please continue. Thank you, sir. So we have uh, seven new academic program proposals to present today. Uh, and just to, to, to let you know, this is really the, the closing out of a, an academic uh, program approval phase, that this is the, basically the end of the, the pipeline, so to say, of programs that were proposed using the old process. And so in the future, as we bring pro programs to you, we'll, we will be using the new academic appro approval program process that you put in place 
earlier this year, uh, together with the academic planning process that we will begin uh, at, the, at the next board meeting. So certainly wanted to let you know uh, of that. So uh, the, the first three programs are all Associate of Applied Science programs, and they all have a sort of a common theme that they are all programs where uh, the, the LCTCS is, or, uh, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and Southern are, uh, so LCTCS is adding uh, an AAS program to, uh, that, 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 that adds a sort of a, the, the, the general education to an existing technical diploma. So we have programs in uh, electrical construction and instrumentation and medical assistant that are technical diploma programs. What, we are at, what they are adding is the general education component of that degree to turn it then into a full-blown Associate of Applied Science degree, which, uh, again, dovetails with the last item on our agenda today, which, subject to your approval, would then allow that student to use that uh, Associate of Applied Science program as a, a pipeline on to, to, to further degrees and further education. So uh, that's, I think, a, a, a welcome trend, and I think something we would expect and welcome to see in the, in the, in the future. So the, the first of these three proposals is an AAS in electrical construction at Nunez. Uh, this program allows students to learn to, to build, install, maintain, and repair electrical systems that provide heat, light, power for residential, commercial, industrial structures, and through course offerings, a combination of theory and hands-on learning. I know certainly this is something that is much needed across our state. Uh, the next is an AAS in instrumentation, also at Nunez. And this program provides classroom and hands-on training that allows students to develop the knowledge and skills to perform the task required of an entry-level instrument fitter and technician. And those include, include uh, key installation, maintenance functions across several industries, such as piping, tubing, fastening, and working with metal production. And then the third proposal is an, uh, an AAS in medical assistant at South Louisiana Community College. Uh, and that AAS in medical assistant is developed to prepare students for employment in physicians' offices, hospitals, uh, medical records, laboratories, and insurance companies. Uh, the, the medical assistant profession is certainly a vital part of the medical community and certainly something where we need additional uh, capacity across our state, just as we do in really effectively all of our healthcare fields. So those are the first three. Let me pivot to the, the other four. The next four are bachelor's degree programs. Uh, the first of those is a Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, uh, in musical theater at Northwestern State. So Northwestern has a, a, a widely recognized uh, fine arts program in performing arts. And recently, their accreditor, the National Association of Schools of Theater, uh, really recommended that they take their broadly written, uh, broadly constructed program in performing arts and begin to specialize it into several uh, specialized uh, and more, more concentrated B, uh, BFA programs. So this is the, really the first of those. And so this program is uh, proposed to provide greater emphasis and greater focus on precisely uh, working in a musical theater. Uh, and certainly this builds on the expertise and excellence that they have there uh, at that institution. Uh, the second program is at LSU Health Sciences in Shreveport, and it is a, a BS in cardiovascular technology. Um, this proposed program is designed to meet the needs for more healthcare professional, professionals focused on addressing Louisiana's high rate of heart disease. And so graduates of the proposed program will be prepared to work with cardiologists, cardiovascular nurses, and other healthcare professionals in diagnosis and treatment of cardiac disorders and cardiovascular disease. Uh, the, the Health Sciences Center has numerous partners with uh, healthcare providers in the area, and LSU Shreveport certainly will be a, a primary feeder to that program. And I'm certainly, as I get older, I certainly welcome having uh, lots more capacity in programs exactly such as this. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the, um, the last two are a BS in nonprofit administration for LSU Shreveport. Um, so actually, this builds on an existing program that LSU Shreveport has. They have a, they have a master's program specifically in uh, nonprofit administration. It's widely successful, very uh, heavily enrolled in, and so they are creating an undergraduate program and actually also an undergraduate certificate 
that that dovetails with and feeds into that very successful master's degree program. I'm sure I don't need to persuade you that there are lots of opportunities for people all across our state to be involved in various different kinds of nonprofit work. And so providing the appropriate <coughs> level of training and structure and education to uh, make sure that the leaders of those programs are well prepared is a really important role. And this actually will be the first standalone undergraduate program in our state uh, in, in, uh, in nonprofit administration. And then the last program uh, for, for me to present today is a BS in occupational physiology, also from LSU Shreveport. Uh, Occupational and environmental physiology is an emerging field of study that explores the effects of environmental work conditions on the body's phys physiological system. So professionals in this field provide strength and conditioning training and education to those who work in highly physical fields, such as those in fire rescue, law enforcement, and other physically demanding uh, um, uh, lines of work. So with that, uh, Senior staff recommends approval of these academic programs as presented. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I think we have a couple of questions. Regent Ewing? Thanks, sir. Yes, thank you. I'm not on the committee, but I would like to ask a question. I'm, of course. I'm interested in, the, in what we're doing with the community colleges. I assume that these three programs are the result of some type of survey that created uh, a demand for this type of instruction to be offered at these three uh, institutions. That's exactly right. So LCTCS has an ongoing and very deep relationship with its with the employers and its local community to really make sure that the programs that they create and the programs that they provide really do provide in very meaningful ways exactly the, the educated workforce that, that the community is asking for and the, the, their local employers are asking for. So I, I know I'm absolutely confident that these, the, 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 these schools have they have the pulse on, on exactly what those local employers are looking for. As I say, at least two of those programs, they have existing and very successful technical diploma programs. What, these are hap what we're really doing today in the first two of those programs especially is allowing those students to not just stop at the technical diploma, but to be able to move on into perhaps other forms of education in the future as well. Are you of the opinion that that is the procedure that is followed by most of the requests that we get to expand programs at community colleges? I, I, I am so persuaded, and of course it, it is, it is uh, and I'll certainly recognize the, the member from LCTCS in just a second, the, uh, it, it is a very important factor of the new kinds of uh, propose, proposal format that we will now be putting in place, not only at our community colleges and technical colleges, but in all of our programs, sorry. Yeah, I would just add that that is a mainstay of our board that uh, programs that we start and I might add programs that we terminate. We terminate programs when there uh, ceases to be an interest or, or a workforce demand for that program. Likewise programs that we start are, are very much especially technical programs or workforce driven all the time. Yeah. My interest is that um, I think it's extremely important that we continue to push toward those programs that match up with what the job demand is and that we are offering uh, education that bring about the skills that can go into the job core. And uh, I sometimes wonder, I like, on this, do we know, can we anticipate how many students we're going to have? Has that been presented as well in these three areas? Because to me, they seem like they are strategic areas. Right. more so than maybe some others. Um, so I will be happy to you uh, to later on in the day or uh, uh, to, to lead you through kind of the format of the new proposal process. It is right at the very heart of, every, of what we will be asking of, of, of every program going forward. What is the demand? What is the future demand? What is the salary outlook? What's the career outlook? What are the skills, knowledge, ability set? that employers are asking for in that area? How are you including that within your degree program? All of those pieces are absolutely at the heart of the new process that we have. And that's certainly not to say that that hasn't been part of what we've been doing in the past, but the reality is that it is, it is very much front and center of what we'll be doing in the future. Thank you. No, you're welcome. And uh, this, kind of going back to a conversation we had this morning, when you think about the fact that we're not really 
able to attract all of our high school graduates in the fields, I think if they saw what the opportunity was in some of these fields that are emerging in their level of importance in our economy, it might help entice some of them to recognize that in a short period of time they could fit into this, which would help them fit into a higher level of salary and a higher level of participation in the economy. Yeah, I, think I, I really do hope that we continue to match the curriculum that we have not only in community colleges but in universities with what is needed in the economy, the job core. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not always sure we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doc, Dr. Di uh, Dr. Denley, uh, I got two, or actually Board of Regents, y'all have heard the recommendation from senior staff. Is there a motion to approve these academic programs? So moved. Moved by Regent Finley and a second by? A second. Uh, Regent LeRae. Um, any further discussion or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. All right, now we're going to add item five, the 2022-23 course articulation matrix. Uh, Regent staff convened a statewide articulation and transfer council on topics <coughs> related to the matrix. Dr. Denley, please proceed with this item. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, so, and so first of all, I want to give a, a big thank you to my colleagues who serve on the statewide articulation and transfer council. Uh, this work is, is work which we undertake each year to try to make sure that as students move from uh, between institutions across our state that we make sure that, that the courses that they take really do transfer in the ways that, that they would expect and that we would very much hope. And so this work has been really on, going on year after year after year for really now more than a decade. Well, I, I really do want to recognize the um, uh, the, the tireless work of one of my staff, Lupe Le Madrid, who this time has juggled, I, I, you know, today I showed you a lot of data to do the work that needed to be done today. She had to juggle basically 28 completely independent spreadsheets and amass them all together. It was really a, a wonderful piece of staff work to bring all of that together. And it, the, the work that we've done has really, I think, brought this to a wonderful conclusion. Uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the way in which the matrix works and the way in which it has worked in the past and now the way that it will work in the future. What I'm showing you is kind of the way that it works perhaps uh, in the most clean way. And we have at the Board of Regents a list of, of all of the courses that are so-called matrix courses and each of those courses has a Regents number. In this case, English Composition 1, Freshman Writing, has the number CENL1013. Across all of our institutions, that course has all kinds of different numbers in their own catalog. So you can see there at, uh, at Bipsy, it's English 101. At LSU, it's English 1001, uh, English 100, and Suno there at, uh, at SENL101B. What the matrix does is creates a crosswalk between those different courses. And so if a student takes, let's say, English 101 at Bipsy and then transfers to Suno, then the school knows how to make the connections. What's happened in the past is when, when those connections have been made well, then of course you get a course-by-course -course transfer. It has not been the case up until now that every time the course exists at the other place that those connections have been made in the way that they ought. And then the other question is, well, what do you do when that course isn't actually taught at that other place? Then how do you transfer it? And so what I'm happy to tell you today is that because of the, the work of the, the SATSI group and, and, uh, and Dr. La Madrid, we have now at least completely settled the questions around general education. It is now the case going forward, subject to your approval uh, in just a second, uh, that uh, any, inst any course which is part of the matrix, which is offered at another institution, will transfer course to course. So not just for freshman writing, but for college algebra or freshman biology, or any course which is taught at one institution and then transferred to a sister institution where they teach that same course, the course will, co will transfer one to one. And then what we've also been able to do is to add a new, a new methodology that recognizes, well, what happens when that course isn't taught at that sister institution? So the example I'm using here is contemporary math. 
that is, is sure enough taught at Bipsy and LSU, uh, but, 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 but it is not taught at SUNA. They just don't offer that course on their campus. And so what we've been able to, to really be able, be able to, 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 to make sure is, well, when that student transfers, let's say, from LSU to SUNO, that, that contemporary math course that they took, they can transfer it course to course. They don't have that course, but they can honor the three hours of general education math credit that that student earned at that sister institution. Does that make sense? And so that's what we've now done across all of the the different subject areas of the matrix, we now have that twofold, twofold bifurcation all across the general education that if the course is a one-to-one -one match, it transfers as that one-to-one -one match. If it is not a one-to-one -one match, there's no course for it to transfer to, but the receiving institution really will recognize that three hours of humanities or three hours of science or three hours of social science or three hours of math or whatever the appropriate recognition is so that that is then counted towards that student's uh, general education requirements. Of course, it is the case that that course will also transfer in ways that it always has in programmatic ways, but it's making sure that we've tied up all of the loose pieces when it comes to general education, which has been somewhat up in the air in the past. So staff recommends the approval of the course articulation matrix as presented, and of course happy to answer any questions that you might have about that. Yes, sir. When a student transfers from one institution to another, um, which institution is responsible for counseling the student on how this transfer should work and making sure that it does? Because so, the student won't have any idea how this works. Yeah, so I mean, I think it, 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 is, it is a sort of a both and kind of conversation. That on the one hand, uh, when, a, when a student is at a particular institution, if it is the case that they, they engage their advisor in saying, look, I am transferring to this, that, or the other school, it commonly happens, especially with, uh, with transfers from community colleges, that the advisor at the community college will, will be aware of what are the requir programmatic requirements at sister institutions that that student might transfer to. It is also the case when they transfer, let's say, to a four-year institution, that that advisor will then have conversations with that student to say, look, these are the courses that are on your transcript. Here, is, here it is how those courses may transfer towards the program and may transfer towards the institution. Well, what we've done through this work is really to to create a whole new level playing field around that. That it's no more sort of in the lap of the gods, if you will, as to whether or not the course you're taking will or won't satisfy a general ed education requirement at that uh, receiving institution. That now is clear. Uh, the conversations will happen in a more nuanced way from a programmatic way. And that in many ways is the next phase of this work where I think you know this year we will be engaging with faculty groups to create universal transfer pathways that will deal with the next level of, of transfer equivalency. What information is presented to the student about what the student has a right to expect uh, on a transfer? Well, I'm glad you asked. So the, the, the next phase of this work, again, subject to your approval today, we will be creating a, an interface that really will allow actual humans to be able to read what these, uh, what these uh, equivalences are. Uh, I mean, the reality is right now, if you go to our website, there is a massive spreadsheet, which sure, sure enough contains all of the information if you, if you read it right. But I, I, I cannot, cannot honestly say that it is an approachable document. We will create a, 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 a really good interface. And Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ms. Warner. That kind of goes to my question, and I think Ms. Liberty's question as well is, um, you know, as, as you, all our terms are starting this week yes. with everyone, and, um, you know, I've dealt with lots of students transferring in and, and how we communicate this. What is the real, I want to know, like in real time, what's the realistic timeline that I'm not going to be getting calls or any of us are going to be getting calls from parents and students saying, why isn't that math transferring? It's been approved. What can we expect in the real time timeline of educating everybody at every university to understand, not just those you know, coming out of community college, but the professors, advisors at the UL system, the LSU system and everything, so that we can smooth this pathway for our students. So I think it's, a, it's, it's not a neat answer that I'm just about to give, but I think it's a realistic one. So first of all, 
Uh, and again, I, I really do want to thank uh, my colleagues on the SATI Council because this is, and, and actually all of the folk who have in, been involved in this audit across all of the campuses. This is not something that was just kind of cooked up in our offices upstairs. This is a Hundreds generational of, problem right. we've heard of since... Right. Back the days I was in school, That's right. eons ago. So, so yeah. hundreds of people across yeah. the state have been involved in this latest review of the matrix and its updates. And so everyone is aware of what it is that we're doing, why it is that we're trying to make it happen, and how it is that it should be implemented. I think it will take time to, to go in and change the degree audit structures on campuses. And depending on how staffed up those IT and registrar's offices are, that may take a little while. And certainly... As you say, it, it's what is it? The, they say uh, the culture takes uh, eats policy for lunch or something like that. I mean, the reality is that this is a change in culture, and it will take ongoing conversations with frontline faculty members to realize: no, look, we we are in a different dawn. But the reality is that at the bottom of now, we do have a, a dependable structure that we all will approve. I yes, think. and I have to commend the the work because I I can't imagine taking this on. This is just. It's such commendable work, and, and it's what we should be doing to help our students. So once the IT and registrar's offices, you said there's going to be faculty group meetings to help disseminate this information and start instructing, and then I, we're, I guess we're dependent on our universities to make sure that it's continued to be disseminated down to the advisor level. Right. So these roadblocks and this red tape, as I see it, starts to kind of break down for our students. Yeah, that's right. So. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I want to say Jan for the January entry, but we may be looking at next fall before really information is disseminated, even with best efforts understanding the bureaucracy within every university system. It's going to take I mean, the reality while. is that the, the action of this board today will mean that this will be, this, this will happen, the, the action of, for this item is today. The reality is that to, you know, to honestly say that we have engaged everybody everywhere in, I think, as you say, will probably take the rest of the academic year in, in meaningful ways. Thank you. I, I like a real timeline to be able to wrap my head around. Thank you so much. And again, I commend the work. Thank you. I believe she yes, sorry. I had a question. Um, I know that we can only do stuff within the public school system, but will you guys be working with your interface, interface with private school systems to help us be able to transfer with them as well, like see if things you know transfer over. Would that be possible to like see? Yeah. So thanks so much for that question. So the the, the way that our policy, uh, our this matrix is constructed, as you say, it is it is policy for the public institutions in the state. But actually, there are several uh, several public uh, private institutions that are also part of. They have agreed to be part of the matrix process. And so when you know when we create that interface. It will be the case that for, for some, not all of, uh, of, of our, 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 our private institution colleagues, they will be listed in there as, uh, as, 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 as how it is that courses transfer across the, across the, across the divide. Yeah. And certainly we hope that in the future that, that, will, that will increase. Uh, those, those institutions will also be part and parcel of the conversations we have around the universal transfer pathways. Again, because recognizing that... Uh, that, that partnership that we have across the public and private institutions. Yeah. So if English composition is taught at either of these demonstrated universities, yeah. then that is accepted automatically. Is any consideration given to, and also this would apply to dual enrollment, to who teaches those courses? Are they taught by graduate assistants? Uh, are they, is there a uh, uniformity in the type of instruction that they get and on um, who gives that instruction. Like I say, it is, a, is it taught by a graduate assistant or is it taught by a full professor? And is that given any weight at all or any consideration in this process? So uh, and it's a, a, in many ways dovetails with the earlier question. When, a, when, when an institution receives a transfer student, then they have an obligation to make sure that the when they provide transfer credit, that they are providing that transfer credit in a way that recognizes academic rigor. And so the agreement that we have is across our public institutions. All of our public institutions are uh, SAC COC accredited. And as part of that accreditation process, they have to, and in, a, in a very, very detailed way, uh, demonstrate on a periodic basis to the accreditor that everyone who is providing instruction 
is appropriately qualified to provide that instruction. And there are significant guidelines as to what appropriately qualified means. And so in that instance, across all of our institutions, we, all of our institutions have that, that baseline level of accountability around the appropriate rigor of the instruction that they provide. If an, if a, if, if an institution receives a student who is accredited by another accreditor or perhaps accredited, not accredited by a regional institution but by uh, some other accreditor, then that does not assuage them of that, of, that, to, of that obligation to make sure that whoever it is who provided that instruction is appropriately qualified. And so uh, that's a, a very important part of the overall, the overall sort of role of an academic officer on an institution to make sure that levels, levels of rigor are appropriate. I know that's not what we're talking about right here, but I wonder how that also applies to dual enrollment. So it because they're exactly accepting credits from dual enrollment in high schools. And uh, would you think that that attitude applied there as well? It applies exactly the same. Is there a screening or? or so to, to teach, so in many ways, and I think it's a really important thing for this board to, to, to know and perhaps for it to be understood more broadly. There is no difference in the expected level of preparation and education for a faculty member to teach a dual enrollment course than to teach any other course on a college campus. There's not some special level of, or some lesser level of expectation for a dual enrollment course. It is exactly the same. Exactly the same levels of expectation for appropriately qualified, exactly the same levels of accountability when it comes to accreditors, all the, from the accreditor's eyes, the dual enrollment course and the course that's taught in a different room are exactly the same courses. And they, it is really important that an institution is able to make that case that they are identical with it, identical levels of expectation, identical le levels of rigor, and identical levels of expectation when it comes to the preparation of the instructor. Thank you. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Denley, for your leadership and, and really for everyone in the Board of Regents and all of our schools and systems. I know this has been decades of banging heads against walls, but uh, I'm glad we finally broken through to have some workable, workable answers. Members, you've heard the recommendation from senior staff. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Uh, moved again. Regent Finley is dominating. Second. <laughs> Second. Second. Second from Regent Seal. Uh, any further discussion or questions? All those in favor, uh, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. All right, uh, now on to the revised minimum admission standards. And I know uh, Dr. Dilley is going to talk about this, and we have some, some questions from our committee and some, some, uh, some public comment as well. So go ahead, Dr. Dilley. Very good, thank you. Uh, so uh, I just, uh, I know the uh, regents heard this as part of the, uh, my, uh, the, 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 the development session earlier, but I think it goes without, uh, it really needs to be said that this work and really all of the work that we try to do across this agency is all lined up behind our master plan, Louisiana Prospers, to make sure that all of the work that we do takes us, as I said earlier, along the journey of reaching our goal of 60% of our adult population being having some post-secondary attainment of value uh, by 2030. And so, all that I'm going to show you today is really taking evidence and research and then using it to inform sound educational policy exactly along trying to reach that goal. And so uh, what I'm, uh, the proposal that we're bringing today, and I need to make it very clear, the proposal that we're bringing today, first of all, unlike everything else on the agenda, would take effect in fall of 2023. So not today, not in the spring, but one year from now for fall 2023. Uh, and, and, so as, and, and it is also the case that as we are looking at this policy, primarily what I am bringing to you are proposals to expand the footing of our, um, the, the, expand the footing of our admission policy. Expand our, the footing of our admission policy in effectively in, in, in two important directions. The first is uh, really a first in the nation approach to early college coursework that for really for, for a very long time here in American higher education 
institutions, states have used two methodologies to allow students to enter university, either a high school GPA or a standardized taste score, uh, an ACT, making the argument that each of those have in the past been good indicators for future success in college. What we are proposing today is that there is also a very good method to know whether or not a student should be expected to be successful in college, and that is their record in taking collegiate level work. And so we are proposing today, as I say, a national first of its kind, additional pathway, additional pathway for students to enter college solely by the, the early college work that they have taken. And then the second, uh, a second uh, expansion is, it is the case that, uh, that this board uh, recognized our HBCU sector as a, as a designated sector in our, in our state. We had not, up until now, recognized that, so that sector in our admission policy. And so we are recognizing both of those. This is the way that that looks in the full document that is before you today. You can see the things that are in blue are the things that are changing. Only the things that are in blue are the things that are changing. And you can see there that we are adding that additional pathway for students that to get into, for instance, uh, LSU, they would be able to be uh, admissible if they have an, a GPA, a core GPA of at least 3.0, or again, traditionally an ACT score of at least 25, or, and you can see in the middle, an associate degree, or at least 18 hours of early college academic credit with a GPA of at least 2.5, and that GPA is on that early college credit. That's the, uh, that's the, the, the piece one. And then piece two are, uh, are really three more expanded admission pathways. Uh, the first is, and we have had for a very long time, going back to 2001, the ability for a student who did not have all of the core requirements, the ability for them to effectively make up for that shortfall in their high school core requirements by having a higher traditionally a higher ACT score. I think, you, you know, we have been moving away from being unifocused on the ACT. And so in this document that I provided, there are now two other options in very much in parallel to what I showed you, that as well as the ACT being three points higher, you could have an or your high school GPA is half a point higher, or the GPA on your early college credits is a quarter point higher. And all those half point, quarter point are aligned in rigor. Again, it is an important thing for you to know today that in no way is anything that we are doing lessening or weakening our admission criteria across the state. Uh, the, 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 the next new pathway is really recognizing that there are students who do not graduate high school in the traditional way. They at, at somehow along their high school journey, that they, they end up dropping out before they earn a high school diploma. We do not want that to be the end of their educational journey. If they choose to instead carry on and earn a, a, a high school equivalency test or an NRS, which is a, a nationally recognized uh, basic adult education test, we want that to be a pathway to being admitted to college and university. And so we have added that that pathway. And then the, the, the last, and I, I kind of mentioned this a little earlier, in our traditional transfer policy, we have not in the past recognized applied associate degrees as a way in which students could now use that degree as a pathway onto uh, further education. And so we are at recommending the addition of that AAS degree in the in the options that a transfer student might use to be able to move forward. We recognize that often some, often some of the technical coursework that is part of an AAS degree might not directly transfer into an academic bachelor's degree, but that should not matter about whether or not the student could use that degree for admission to that degree. And so we really, it's very much in spirit of the way in which we are building out the stackable credential ideas of admission. So those are the additions. The, the last two items are, are two, two ways in which we're proposing to, two provisions that we're proposing to remove. Uh, the first is a pilot provision around co-requisite remediation. It is pilot language which has been 
in our policy for quite considerable time, really to encourage institutions to move toward implementation of the co-requisite model. I hope you'll remember that back in the co-requisite model, so the new improved way to do developmental education. Back in March, uh, this body approved fully scaling development, the, the moving to the co-requisite model across all of our institutions uh, by next fall for math and by the following fall for English. And so really language talking about a pilot is now, it's not in keeping with where we now are as a state. I will say that it is the case that we have uh, we, we have an ongoing conversation with our regional institutions about recognizing that as we now move to fully scaling co-requisite remediation, that some, some provision that is in the spirit of this pilot language uh, should be introduced, not in the admissions policy, but more than likely in the placement policy. And so we are certainly welcoming having an ongoing conversation with our regional institutions about how it might be that we would recognize the way that placement should happen when co-requisite remediation is fully scaled. But pilot language really doesn't have a place in our admission policy anymore now that we have uh, fully scaled. And then the last provision is that provision that, uh, that, that allows institutions not to count a student as an exception if they meet certain GPA and course requirements that are outside the summer bridge program. So students who come in in the fall, they don't meet the usual admission criteria. They take courses in the fall, and then at the end of the fall, an institution could look and see how that fall turned out, and if it was successful enough, then they could say, well, then you were not an exception. We, we, we believe that, that because of now all of the changes we've made about widening pathways and the changes we've made about placement, that we believe it's time to remove that provision, there is language that enables a much broader understanding of summer bridge in the language that we're proposing. And certainly there was a question as to whether or not summer bridge programs were eligible for, uh, for Pell support. That is absolutely the case. They, they certainly are eligible for Pell support, and we've certainly passed that information on. There are very successful summer bridge programs that work in that way uh, across the nation, and certainly some of those I've worked with in the past, and we'll be more than happy to make the connections to help uh, those things be uh, created here in the future. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, staff uh, recommend the approval of these expanded admission pathways and other proposed revisions to the minimum admission standards, as we say, effective in fall 2023, and of course happy to answer any questions that, uh, that there may be. Thank you, Dr. Yes. And some high schools, a C would be a D in another high school because of the expectations of that community and that school and that principal and those teachers. So it worries me uh, about that. Number two, uh, who is paying the tuition for these students that are in high school to take the college course? Because I know if you're out of high school, you have to find a way to pay tuition. How about in high school? How are they going to pay tuition? So let me answer the, the first question first. So uh, it, it is the case that, so effectively this is a, a, a piece of language. Right? We have a document called the Minimum Admission Standards. Today we are presenting revisions to it, and so they are the revised Minimum Admission Standards. In no way are we changing the ACT or GPA expectations for students to be able to enter college. In no way are we diminishing or reducing the expectations or standards that students need to, 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 um, needs to meet. I, I recognize perhaps the unfortunate way in which the language could be construed. It is, that is not the way in which things are being, being done at all. So today, 
The standards that we've had and the standards that we've had in place for 20 years, they remain. We are adding this additional, and it is a, you know, these, the, the, the pathways that we're creating in dual enrollment, I certainly don't want anybody to imagine that these are light expectations. To, to take those early college courses, this is demanding, and we expect our students to, to meet those demanding expectations to, uh, to, to be admitted to our programs. Around the funding of dual enrollment, as things currently stand, this is, um, there are all kinds of ways in which uh, different institutions and different high schools are meeting the financial uh, obligation for students to be able to take dual enrollment courses. I, th I know we, it is certainly uh, a, a, a high agenda of, of this agency's part to try to understand how that can be done in a more effective way across the state. We are committed to making sure that those opportunities are more available to more students more often all across our state but as things currently stand, it is a, it is a varied picture, school to school and uh, high school to high school. Well, most of these students, can, families, cannot pay a tuition in high school. So undoubtedly, somebody else is picking up the chart, right. the cost. Yeah. And uh, that bothers me that, that we're, I know we got the Go Grants, we got TOPS, we got other things for students that graduate. But uh, uh, just a two-point grade point average, and then somebody pays their way for a college course sort of bothers me. Thanks, sir. So if I could just add, uh, Regent McDonald, thank you for that comment. There are, uh, as uh, Dr. Denley has mentioned, many ways that individuals are paying for dual enrollment currently in the, in the MFP. There are specific dollars that are allowable for dual enrollment as well as ACT prep and other things. So there are, um, is it nine, ten million dollars of uh, supplemental course allocation dollars in the MFP that can be used. And so when we are in conversations with school districts, we see some districts that are using theirs dollars, some school districts that are scholarshipping the students, some school districts where the students are paying or the parent, it's a little bit of everything. And so we've had a dual enrollment task force for two years focused on trying to beat the drum for the importance of dual enrollment, ensure we have more information for parents and students, and now our next frontier obviously is making sure we do the funding um, allocation. So we think this is very sound policy, but you're absolutely right. We have to make sure there's not equity, there is equity and opportunity, and that it's not inequitable in terms of access to the courses. That's right. Thank you for that comment. I'd like to go back to slide 54, please, sir. The removal, uh, and this is a question, this is a question that relates to uh, our audit process. When we audit the uh, degree to which the universities are um, meeting the exceptions requirement on admissions. As I understand the removal um, that you're recommending, uh, B would would mean that the moment when a student is classified as an exception or not is at the moment of admission, not some time later when the institution can look to see if a course he took, he passed. That's is that, right. Is that's that right? Exact, that's exactly right. The, the, with, uh, with, with the removal of that provision, all of, the, all of the current structure around exceptions still exists. There is no change to that in the document, but you're right that when a, the, the decision as to whether or not a student is an exception would be at the moment of enrollment, not at some, uh, some future moment. That's, that's important for audit committee purposes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, again, a lot of work done in this, and um, I'm a huge fan of the dual enrollment and very pleased to see the progress we're making there. But um, I'd like to go to the um, issue of the summer of the exceptions and summer ad admissions. Sure. Um, LSU is extremely concerned that even though it's been explained, we've discussed this morning, we've had sidebars this morning, that Pell money is available to students in the summer term. What, our, what adds to our concern is that for a student to enroll at LSU A&M, for example, mm -hmm. 
The summer enrollment costs are near $6,000, of which Pell would only cover about $1,700, leaving that student having to tap into fi their financial aid before the start of the fall semester, thereby reducing the amount of aid available to them. So this is a point LSU wants to be sure is clearly understood by the committee and by this, by this body, that we are now hamstringing, potentially hamstringing Pell students especially, those that we are really making an effort in the state of Louisiana to try to help and bring to the table, um, that they would then have to access their financial aid package early reducing their ability to use that financial aid in the fall in their full time, you know, for their entire 15 hour, 12 hour, whatever it is, load. So that's a concern we have in this proposal. Um, and we'd like to see a little more investigation and conversation around how we intend to help those students without hamstringing them financially when we're doing everything we can to make access for all of our students and those who wish to come be Louisiana students, whether it be at LSU, McNeese, Nichols, wherever it is, but for the LSU system is the, that which I'm speaking for today. Yeah, no, understood. And, 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 and I really want to thank you for that, that comment and really want to thank all of the, um, the, the, the staff across all four systems who have really been, so it's been a very a vibrant and I think very productive conversation across all four uh, systems as we have come to, to, to bring the proposal that we have today. Uh, so there are, uh, the, there are ways in which those summer bridge, so summer bridge students can be served using financial aid packages in ways that I think are more, uh, more favorable than that. And I, as, I, as I've, I've pledged to uh, the folk at LSU, I am more than happy to make the connections with, I mean, the, 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 the archetypal uh, uh, creation of this is Georgia State. Georgia State has been able to produce a, a summer bridge program for more than a decade that has really extraordinary, I mean, Georgia State, I think, is a, a national model in, as an institution that is able to completely level the playing field on graduation rates uh, based on, well, on race, gender, income, any, any disaggregation that you want. And a, a keystone of that approach is exactly the way in which they're able to use their summer bridge program to enable students who would otherwise not be admissible, admissible to Georgia State to be, uh, to be able to, to come. And so I'm more than happy to, to make those connections to help, help, uh, help everyone understand what are the ways in which you can create that package. So that is without them having to reduce, you know, I'm concerned about our, you know, LSU students next fall, because we're talking about fall of 23. Yeah. That, you know, I don't want a student to come here, okay, we've got your Pell money, that's great. Now to cover your cost of living in Baton Rouge or Thibodeau, Lake Charles, wherever, now you have to go into your student loan package. You know, here we are talking today about, I hope the announcement's been made that the president's going to reduce student loan obligations. We hope that that will continue so to move myself. forward for all of our students. Welcome. But here we are talking about potentially hamstringing that um, as, we, as we are trying to make progress, and I commend the progress, absolutely. So could you give a little more detail, and I don't want to take everyone's time, but I think it's important we understand the implication of this particular thing, because we're talking real dollars for real people right. and, who are trying to access higher education and meet, and we're trying to meet our goals sure. for the state. No, I, I appreciate it. And, and just to clarify, the, the way in which a summer bridge program works, we are not recommending any change to the way in which summer bridge programs work now or have worked for the last 20 years. What we are saying is, what we are recommending is that what happens in the fall, the way in which students who would otherwise have come in in the fall, that that is, uh, that is adjusted in an important way. So we're not actually changing the way in which summer bridge programs function, but at least the way in which I understand the way in which summer Pell works, and summer Pell has, has had some important changes. we're all on that learning curve right now. Exactly. Like summer Pell has had some important changes in the recent past, but one of the important subtleties of this is that high school students High school students who study in the summer, the, that summer is part of their, is, is, it's how it is that we now think of the, secret, the sequence of semesters. And so there is, there, is, there is an important strategy to making sure where that summer is. Is that summer part of the previous academic year, where for most of the academic year they were in high school, or is it part of the ongoing academic year when they, they, they now are a college student? And that... That, that, that way of awarding financial aid is a really important 
uh, strategy towards this. That's the way in which Georgia State has been able to make success, and I, I believe we can make a similar success here. Is the state of Louisiana, are we prepared to do that? Because we're talking only a year from now. So are we, you know, do we have that in place that our, you know, our financial aid packages, I mean, this takes a lot of work. This is legislative. This is all our higher education. Where are we going with this? Because I don't want to see one student turn down or one student say, I can't afford you anymore. I can't come to Louisiana. You know, we're trying to bring talent and keep our talent here. And we're competing against state universities, you know, across the South who are plucking off our best and brightest. Let's, you know, we all know this. So how are we, you know, th there's a lot of bureaucracy to get through when we're talking about student loans and financial aid funding. And I just want to make sure we're not taking even one year of student enrollment and saying, oh, sorry, you fell in that gap before we caught up on the financial end of this policy. Certainly, that's my hope, too. As I say, okay. we are not changing in any way the way in which summer bridge programs currently function. And, and certainly, summer bridge programs have been happening across our state for a considerable amount of time. I'm, I'm good with that. Good. But my concern is that when we change the fall bridge, where the Pell, the traditionally, the right. Pell, the student loans, the financial aid package kicked in August 22nd for whatever or whatever the date is that that is my, that's my concern that now it has to go to the summertime hampering their progress in the fall or their ability to pay for a full fall semester the full college experience what we are trying to you know what we are trying to achieve along with the summer bridge getting them absolutely ready absolutely have no problem with that part but making sure we've looked at the effect on their package for the entire remainder of that academic year. Let me, let me ask a question to make sure, and I, I certainly appreciate, Mary, your perspective, but Dr. Denley, I want to make sure, are you suggesting that as the Pell calendar year, if, I call, if I'm taking the prior year rather than going into the current year, that that potentially would solve the financial burden? So what I'm saying is, and I'm, so I freely admit that I am not a financial aid professional, and so I don't want to in any way mislead this group. But what I know is that there are, and Georgia State's not alone in this, there are national, nationally renowned, extraordinarily well-constructed bridge programs that have this solved. Okay. And had it solved for a decade. And that so would solve we, the financial burden question that exactly. Ms. Warner is asking. That's okay, right. thank you. No, I don't think it does solve that problem. I think she's got the practical thing that if you use some of your money for the summer, then you don't have it to go forward if you get accepted to the university. Isn't that what you're asking about? That's the concern. That's the, the, practical the Pell question point. is answered. So what is the package? Do you have go grants? Do you have, I mean, what is the package that helps that student that we're really trying to help get in a pathway? What is the financial consequences that if she uses, he or she uses her money in August or the, during the summer term to get qualified, they don't have it to go forward. Isn't that what I understand? Correct. Correct. The That's the practical the question. This morning. So, yeah. so let me make sure we're all clear here. Dr. Denley's point is that Georgia State for over a decade has run a summer bridge program with Pell packaging that does not impact the freshman year going forward and that there are many institutions across the country that have done successful summer bridge programs that are financed. In addition, Dr. Denley has shared the contact information for Georgia State's person with LSU so that they can get that information. Uh, Trustee uh, Warner's comment is, a, is an important one. We want students to have the resources to be able to go forward. Her point is, if the student uh, cannot afford to go in the summer, they have to go in the fall, and therefore, what's the impact on their Pell or their financial aid packaging? And what is the state's responsibility? We, as, in, as the state, at the board, as the Board of Regents, can offer uh, the power to convene and to talk with experts who are doing this well across the country now. The financial aid packaging rests with the institutions, but we can help build the capacity of the institutions to do that because Dr. Denley and others know many places that are doing this successfully. So yes, LSU has raised an important concern. What about fall bridge programs and how do we fund it if you're asking us to move the students to the summer? 
The point that's being made is there are people that have been doing this successfully for over a decade. We can bring them together. We have more than, we have a year for implementation and so we can get this right. That is the point. What, what other institutions besides Georgia State? Have Across the country who are really doing bridge programs well. So, um, program you're wanting to go to. Yeah, so, um, so if, we, if, we look in, uh, if we look in Tennessee, and actually the University of Memphis does an extremely good job of this. Uh, if, we look in, um, uh, if we look in Texas, then actually if we look at the uh, University of Houston, they do a really good job around this. So there's a, there's a, number, of different, uh, a, a number of different models that we can, we can bring in. There's no reason to, to limit to only one school. large city yes. institutions. Memphis, Georgia State, which is in Atlanta. In Atlanta. And then University of Houston. University of Houston. University of Houston. Yeah. So does that model translate to rural students in Louisiana? Yeah, I mean this is about this is about financial aid packaging. This is it's it's really about how it is that you understand how to use federal guidelines in an appropriate way. We have some, we'll go ahead. Could I, just, yes. I want to appreciate everybody's questions and, and tying up the ends, commissioner, everything. We all know that each university in this state works within its own, I hate to call it bureaucracy, but let's be frank about it. You know, when, you, when we're helping kids get in and we're dealing with all this stuff and, and we're at the regents level, we have our supervisory level of all our systems, and then we get into the university. Realistically, Dr. Den Denley, do you think that 12 months is enough time for us to convene these other universities to come into the state? I'm optimistic that it is. Um, to help create packaging, we're already recruiting the classes of 23. Mm -hmm. we're already, that ship has already sailed. So um, my concern is that we're not allowing ourselves enough time with this provision. I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do. I'm just very concerned that we are going to hit a class that is going to have an unfortunate repercussion because of the speed of this. Um, and so I would, I don't know that I'm really asking for a delay, I'm just asking everyone to really give that consideration that is this really, and Commissioner, I, you know, you and I could have another conversation about it, I'd love to, is that realistic? Because like I said, admissions, recruiting, and packages are already being talked about with the class entering in 23, much less bringing them in in June of 23 for a summer bridge program. Is, you know, do we really think that's a realistic goal, knowing the pace with which higher education sometimes can move in, in having to ask people to come from other states and our universities find time on their calendar while we're already in this admissions process? So I do think, I do think that it's completely reasonable. I mean, so, if there's one thing today, Zoom, you know, Zoom has been a transformational business when it comes to bringing people together from, you know, I've spent a lot of my life over the last decade getting on a plane and going to some place and being there a day to talk to people. You don't have to do that anymore, right? We are, we're a click away from having important conversations, piece one. Uh, piece two, uh, ways in which packaging happens. I mean, I agree. It is the case that students are being recruited and almost admitted for next year. Financial aid packaging is not happening today. Financial aid packaging will happen after Christmas once the, the, once the tax year has happened. So we're not at that packaging place. Uh, and the reality is I think we are all committed to doing this work in the most effective way possible. The changes that we're talking about are not only advantageous, they're not only advantageous to students who might otherwise have been in a fall bridge and are now moved to a summer bridge, we are, as I say, already have summer bridge programs that have been in existence for a long time. If there's, if there's a better way to implement those summer bridge programs that already exist, well, I certainly would encourage people to avail themselves of that, of that, of that, of that useful thing. So, so I think there's, there's an urgency all around. Yes, it is, there's an urgency to make sure that we appropriately serve students who might perhaps be uh, be moved from one semester to another, but I think there's an urgency to make sure that we are serving all of our existing students in the most effective way. And I'm not saying necessarily that we're not serving them well now. I just want to make sure that 
that people, I mean, conversations should happen. And I'm, as I say, happy, happy to try to make the connections as early as possible. I want to be clear. I, I completely agree with you that we are serving students and we're doing our best to serve even more students. However, a $5,000 price tag added on to what is already, higher education is already costly enough. Um, we all agree that, um, to me, is the great concern today that we are saying not even 12 months from now, we're talking about 10 months from now because we're asking them to, to now, you need to come in June to Baton Rouge. And so now we're adding $5,000 because Pell's gonna take, Pell's gonna cover 1,700. But that's a big price tag for a great number of people. And, and I just want to be sure that we are giving that issue the most consideration. Uh, I agree, but, but, but I do wanna make sure that the committee understands we, we're not adding, we're not adding cost to the degree. We're simply, if it is the case that someone comes in as a bridge program, the hours that they take in that bridge program really do count towards their degree. So it, it isn't the case that now suddenly they have to be in, you know, uh, like there's no extra semester or any of those kinds of things. The reality is that we're simply moving their education back a semester. They're, they're, I'm not saying that it's, I'm not certainly not saying that in general there might not be some cost, but it's not an additional anything. Certainly not if we, if we try to deliberately construct this not only just across a bridge, but across the entirety of their study. Right? How can we create it in such a way that we're not artificially lengthening their time to degree, but just simply moving the structure of their curriculum? I think that's an important piece. So one other point I want to make sure we make is that summer bridge is not required. All of our institutions have exceptions, uh, allowances. And so they can decide to allow students to admit, be admitted by exception in the fall or spring with no summer bridge requirement at all. The provision of the summer bridge allows students to enroll and cure their exception so that they're not counted as an exception. So now currently in the, in the summer bridge and in the fall, institutions can enroll students who would not be admittable, admiss, admissible and cure their exception. So I want to make sure we're clear about access for students, uh, and I know Mary and I agree on this, access for students. So this is not taking away the opportunity for students to be enrolled or to be enrolled as an exception. It was just a way for students to demonstrate academic proficiency in the summer or fall and then not be counted as an exception. So to Regent Seal's point about a, the auditing process and Regent Levy's question about are we auditing the exceptions, that is what this conversation is about. How many exceptions an institution has and are they admitting students in the summer or a fall bridge program? In addition to the, the good point about affordability. So, Expansion of a summer bridge program is not required. It is an option. Scholarship stu it's scholarshiping students in a summer bridge program is allowable. So the Board of Regents does not determine how you fund a summer bridge program, whether you do a summer bridge program, whether you expand a summer bridge program. Those are institutional and management board conversations. But to the good question of are there experts across this country and are they doing it well in innovative ways? And will the Board of Regents serve as a convener for the conversation? The answer is absolutely yes. I just want to say, I, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't say there are other options. And you can summer bridge with the community college, which drastically reduces those costs. So, you know, I, I know LSU has a fine program, but there are other programs, there are other partnerships between four-year institutions and community colleges that will, will you know, lower that, make, make that option much more affordable for students and still uh, help them accomplish the goal of, of uh, uh, remedying those deficiencies. I just wanted to say Thank that. you for that, that point. And we, we do have language in the policy that really highlights the fact that we encourage those kinds of partnerships to be created. Thank you. And I know we have public comments from uh, current president of Board, Board Supervisors of LSU, uh, Rudy Starnes, to talk, and, and Dr. Henderson as well.
Chairman Davi, thank you very much. Chairman Temple, Commissioner Reed. Um, um, I want to thank Supervisor Warner for the great work she does here for us um, at Regents, and uh, and thank the Regents for allowing me to speak. My name is Ramey Wazan Starnes. I am the chairman of the LSU Board of Supervisors, and last week I conferred degrees on the largest, most diverse class LSU has ever had. Um, this was a class that was comprised um, from enrollment based on um, discussions that we had with regents and others about exceptions and admissions requirements and things of that nature. We have Dr. Jose Olivas, Avilas, who is our ad, uh, admissions director, and he does a fantastic, he and his staff do a fantastic job. We are complying with all the requirements that uh, regents has asked of us, that we have negotiated, worked on together about enrollment, and things are going extremely well. This, and I'm specific, sp speaking specifically about uh, B here, is a, uh, a solution in search of a problem. We are doing what we're supposed to do. We have professionals who are enrolling um, LSU Tigers um, the best we have ever done it. Um, by placing an additional barrier or an opportunity to not be an LSU Tiger in front of students, it just makes it more difficult for us to continue to diversify and grow our class the way that we are currently doing it. Um, I echo um, all of Supervisor Werner's concerns about uh, the illusory nature of the Pell Grant for a summer school, which doesn't cover cost of tuition, would be a barrier to people coming to Baton Rouge earlier um, and um, taking courses at LSU. Um, we've also talked about these this exceptions, and we and the things that we have discussed with regents over the years about the percentage of exceptions that we're allowed, um, and whether we are complying with our requirements there. Um, this would upset all those negotiations and compromises we've made over the last several years. There's just simply no need to change that. It's working. And um, I've heard you talk about the goals for 2030. I'm positive that LSU is well on its way to, to doing our end of the uh, um, deal and in graduating more people, more diverse people, potentially more people than we ever have before. And I would add, I would, I realize that maybe delaying it is a good idea. I don't think it needs to be passed at all. I think I urge each of you to reject um, re um, removing B from the requirements um, before you. I don't have those numbers in front of me. Of course, we could supplement whatever the numbers are. Um, I've talked to the people in our school who tell me that um, they're, they're very concerned about the impact this would have on um, the way we're, we've been moving at Regents, um, with Regents about how we admit people. Um, the Fall Bridge Program, the Fall Bridge Program, that, that probationary period, um, I know that we have com we have complied with it, um, and we are doing extremely well in identifying people who, through whatever objective metrics, may not have um, seemed like they could do college level coursework at the level that that we would like them to, um, have in fact done it by large numbers. I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but um, I have talked to people about it, and we are complying with what we've said we would do, and it's going extremely well. So I've heard that LSU also has LSU E. Would that be an option for LSU students who are interested? Could they go there first with uh, less tuition burden and then transfer to LSU systems? Well, we do have a, a school in Eunice, yes, um, and we're very proud of it. Um, but obviously there's options to, and I was, was listening earlier, but there's, there's pl plenty of options um, about what you could do to comply with it. My point is, we don't need to change what we're doing now. It's working. Um, 
We have that fall bridge program, that, that probationary period in the fall. That is working. We have the largest and most diverse class and, and highest performing and highest numbers in incoming class. In every one of those metrics, LSU is doing better than we ever have before. So we, just, we don't need to change what we have been working for for the last several years along with regents. So this, and this would, this would upset all of those things, and I, I don't think it's necessary at all. I think it's, a, it's not the right direction, and I urge you to reject it. Uh, let me appreciate the good comment that you've made, um, Regent LaBriere, about the partnership between our community colleges and our four-year institutions, how important that is. Uh, uh, Chairman Starnes, always happy to have you here. Let me just make one point of clarification. We are very proud of the diverse graduation, graduating classes that we see from our institutions, but to couple a conversation about diversity and exceptions is inappropriate. We have African American students in this state who are doing phenomenal academic work. And so I want to make sure to clarify that you are not saying that this particular fall bridge program is directly resulting in you having a diverse graduating class. Because we, we need to make sure we're very clear. Mr. Our African American students are able to do phenomenal things. Our diverse students are able to do phenomenal things. So for you to want to have a broad fall bridge program to get rid of exceptions is one thing. I understand your position, but let's not couple a diverse graduating class and exceptions. Uh, Commissioner, I've said nothing of the sort and they implied nothing of the sort. And uh, frankly, I'm taken aback by the suggestion that I have. The fact of the matter is I've said LSU is doing everything right. And everything right means having the highest performing largest and most diverse graduating class we've ever had. And I don't think we need to change what we're doing in terms of admissions or enrollments. Our professionals are doing an excellent job in identifying people to be LSU Tigers, and we don't need to change that um, with these types of um, devices um, because we don't want to upset what we're doing. That's what I've said, and I've implied nothing else. I appreciate the comment, and I also want to say this board stands completely with the with President Tate and his scholarship first agenda. We know that a scholarship first agenda means the strongest flagship possible, and that means a more robust graduate uh, student population. Uh, and, and we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to support that. So I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the, uh, the partnerships we have across all of our various institutions, and certainly appreciate you personally coming to express uh, your opinion about the policy. Thank you very much. Doctor, I'd like to ask to, in relation to his c comments, and I appreciate you coming and stating your position. Why does the fall, why are you proposing that the fall, what do you call it, fall bridge be eliminated? So the fall bridge program is specifically used to increase the number of students who can be admitted uh, who do not meet LSU exceptions and then can demonstrate their academic po uh, potential through the program. The summer bridge program allows you to do that. And so we said, we're not going to suggest that you not do summer and fall. Our recommendation is that you lean into your summer bridge program, that you partner with the community colleges LSUE and others, and that you continue to move forward with your scholarship first agenda, which is making sure you're focused on research and being the strongest flagship possible. So in no way are we trying to remove an option for students. If LSU wants to admit students uh, in a summer bridge program to get rid, rid of exceptions, they can do that and they can do it in the summer. And so instead of having two options for that, we're saying, why don't you do it in one option? But we're, what we're not saying is there are no options. I'm not on the committee, but would, would, would it be appropriate to uh, defer until we found out about how these other universities are supplementing or covering that cost deficit? Um, I got a feeling that if you've got a $6,000 cost and a $1,700 application that there's got to be some supplemental money and universities may be doing that but we don't know that 
And uh, I know that's a point that I'm concerned about. And uh, I just wondered if one month would make a lot of difference that we get that clarified. You've mentioned that it's going on in other places. You have not mentioned specifically whether it was all covered by Pell Grant, not covered by Pell Grant, covered by supplemental scholarship. How, how was that done? Uh, so my interest is do we in fact, because it, there's a path once you graduate from high school, it is automatic a lot of times that you move right on to college. And if that can be, if they graduate from high school the 1st of uh, May, which they're all doing now, I used to go to Labor Day, but uh, <clears throat> that was in the old days. And then they can step right on into the process. That, that's an automatic. And a lot, of, you know, a lot of students over the years have gone to summer school so that they could show that their GPA and their grades and all, let them come in and, the, and fall. That's not new. I just wonder if we're interrupting that chain of uh, process by not having the money straight. And I'd, my only point would be, and I cannot make the recommendation because I'm not on the committee. <laughs> but we may be, uh, my vice chair will sit down. Go ahead, Mr. This is a follow up to uh, what Regent Mary just stated. I thought that uh, Dr. Denley actually has stated that they're going to take a look at how you fund it, that we're not going to bypass the process of looking at how we fund it. We're just going to do it. Uh, from here until the time it actually is implemented. Am I correct on that? To, to clarify, if I may, and I don't, I don't want to take up any, anyone else's time. I know we have a long day ahead and lots on the agenda. Um, To clarify, Ella, my position, my questions about, about the funding, and Dr. Denley, I want to thank you again for the conversation about this, is the potentially 700 out-of-state LSU Pell students who we are asking now, if you want to come demonstrate to us where we allowed you in the fall, now you need to come in the summer. Adding that expense, living expenses, moving expenses, you don't have your summer job wherever you lived, you're leaving your family at the end of but maybe you graduate May 15th and now you're coming in two weeks. What, what the impact of that is, I don't think we have enough information on the impact of that. We have not begun the discussions and I graciously accept and, and look forward to the Board of Regents convening these conversations. They have proved to be very valuable when we've come together um, with the Regents in the past. But I think there's a lot of work to be done because 700 students, that's a lot of, that's a lot of kids. They were asking to, okay, now you have to come in the summertime to not be an exception. If, you, if LSU still wants them to be an exception, they prove their grade point average in the fall. We have that whole policy and we, we beat that horse, right? We're, we're past that. But this is my uh, specific concern um, and I appreciate uh, Regent Ewing's comments on this because I just think we don't have enough information of how the mechanics of this are going to work right now. I am optimistic that we'll be having these conversations before football season's over and we'll be ready to roll with how we're going to package this and come, LSU can come back to Regents and say it's figured out. No student is going to be hampered in this. But, you know, there's the academic, but let's all be very frank because we deal with TOPS, we deal with our board scholarships, we do deal with all our scholarship programs that are, uh, you know, approved by this body how students pay for their education and how Louisiana supports them is critical in this conversation. It's critical in every higher education conversation we have. And I'd like to see more, you know, more work done on this. I'd like LSU to bring more information to the table and to see these conversations convened before action is taken on this item. Thank you. Can I ask real quick, as, as Mary, because uh, I'm not trying to follow it, I'm, I'm, I think I'm following it. And be classified as accepted until they completed their not necessarily if they complete their they come in as accepted and they and then and if they succeed we can retroactively say they're not accepted what difference would it make if they are given an additional option of coming in the summertime even if it costs them more money they could choose no we want to come in in the fall 
LSU is very concerned that Pell students don't have that option to find the extra five or six thousand dollars it costs to live um, at LSU. But they would have come in the fall and had the money. But their student loan packages are full at fully funded at the beginning of the fall semester, they would have to take from that. As I understand it today, and this is part of the conversations that we want to have with Georgia State, University of Houston, how does that work? We, don't, we would not want them then to not be full-time students in the fall because they didn't have the financial aid to pay for that. I understand, I think yeah. that if we did nothing, they would come in the fall, they would get Pell Grants, full Pell Grants, and if they succeed, they would be reclassified, not to their benefit, but for the benefit of the university, as not being exempt. Correct. I think we have so two why issues. Would, why would the additional option of going to summer school, even if it costs more, which I hope it doesn't, but even if it does cost more, that wouldn't force any of that 700 to do that. They could still come in the fall just like they've always done, correct? If, if the fall bridge program is still in place. Yeah, there are some. I, if there's not a removal of the fall bridge program under the proposal, is there? So my understanding is, now correct me if I'm wrong, uh, LSU's uh, supervisors, there are Pell students who are participating in summer bridge programs today. I would have to go get those numbers. Right, so, so, so to Regent Levy's comment, there are a suite of students who are currently demonstrating proficiency in summer bridge and figuring out how to package with LSU support. And so our point was, let's do that as opposed to a summer and a fall bridge but it's not taking away the summer bridge option and there are students currently who are availing themselves of summer bridge. Don't, don't the acceptance letters for LSU don't come out till May, correct? I think they send their letters out Start before December. Yeah. Before December. We okay. start in December. December. January, December. January, December. May. Mm -hmm. but some get them some, later. Yeah, some students, yeah receive acceptances even into the summer months. So they'd have to make a real quick decision on their financial stability to come to Summer Bridge or forget LSU. Or is it keeping the school so. up because you're taking one person Well, good afternoon, uh, Commissioner and, and, and members of the Board of Regents. I'm honored to be here as always and, and uh, appreciate the time. I, I have to thank uh, the Commissioner and Tristan Denley for being accessible and spending so much time uh, with me personally having conversations about this. I think Tristan and I were on the, the phone from mile marker 120 to uh, past Livonia s Saturday. So thank you. Thank you for that. That's how we keep track of time in my car. I, uh, I do think it's important to have a little bit of, of context here as well. We, um, you know, Louisiana, when we did selective admissions in the early part of this century, we classified institutions related to their missions. You know, we aspired to have regional universities that were fulfilling the needs for the communities and the regional economies in which they existed. We had a burgeoning community college system that was just getting into transferable general education and, and starting to find its way. You know, we had statewide institutions that, that were beginning to focus more on research, and, and I dare say that the, the, the tremendous success of UL Lafayette in achieving its, its recent Carnegie R1 designation is rooted in those days that this body oversaw. Um, a flagship agenda that promised that we would have an LSU that was competing with the Texas A&Ms and while Georgia State is a fine institution, I really hope we would be competing with Georgia Tech, for instance. So it's important that we have in Louisiana a, a, a robust assortment of institutions that are focused on their mission and more importantly, focused on serving the students of Louisiana. Admissions criteria really shouldn't be an institutional conversation as much as it should be about students and how do students that graduate from Louisiana high schools, are they prepared for college and career success? And do they have opportunities available to them to, to realize their potential? We exist for one purpose, and that's to improve the human condition. And we do that through workforce development and economic development and community development. It's all human development. 
Now, these conversations around admission standards are always going to be a little bit heated. They're always going to have some uh, what we perceive as winners and losers, but I dare say that the winner has to be the student that we're trying to serve. And we put that student in the best position for success. Now, I, we have institutions that are concerned, and I have some concerns about the co-requisite model. You know, we eliminated remedial courses in Louisiana. This is something that I don't know that we've celebrated quite enough. And this really was led by Commissioner Reed, this body, and of course, Tristan has, Dr. Denley has a lot of experience with this as well. But the co-requisite model, I was introduced to it at Bossier Parish Community College when Deanna Hardy would teach college algebra classes at 9 o'clock on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. But she kept her 9 o'clock hour on Tuesdays and Thursdays open because she brought all of those students back so she could help them with homework and help them understand. That was a co-requisite model. It wasn't called that 15 years ago. It was just a teacher that was focused on learning for her students. Well, guess what? We've, implement, we've, we've institutionalized this co-requisite model, and we've seen some incredible successes in serving students that are ready for college-level work, and they're starting in the first semester with college-level mathematics and completing that requirement. The co-requisite model is a, is a tremendous success story for the state of Louisiana. Uh, we think that it's important that our regional institutions, especially as they serve their regional economies, are able to offer those co-requisite models to all of the students that aspire to attend those institutions. We also have some very specific concerns about the University of New Orleans and understanding, I think, in, in a more detailed way what the mission of an urban research university is, how that institution can serve the citizens of Orleans Parish and Jefferson Parish while maintaining its in, 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 in concert with Southern University of New Orleans as they, as they serve the largest metropolitan area of the state of Louisiana, how they can really be compared to a university of, of, of Memphis or to a Louisville university to share common mission, or actually a Georgia state is very quite similar to the mission of a University of New Orleans. Dr. Denley, Commissioner Reed has pledged to work with us and talk through these conversations over the coming months. We think that's important. Today is really about the expanding opportunities with these programs, these pathways, that give more opportunities for students to become educated. You know, I, uh, Regent Ewing was talking about how LCTCS is preparing students to go to work in jobs that are in demand, and I think that's so important, and we've got to look at the jobs that are in demand today. AT&T is expanding uh, access to connectivity con across the state. They have a, a, an immediate acute need for people that can connect fiber. It's very simple. And LCTCS is well prepared to produce those students right now. But at the same time, we have to be focused on work in 2030. We have to understand how technology is advancing so quickly that we're preparing students for jobs that haven't even been imagined yet. That's why at UL System, we've developed a core competency model that ensures that every graduate, whether you graduate in naval architecture, or you graduate in cybersecurity, or you graduate in the theater, that you have the ability to communicate, to think critically and creatively, that you're culturally competent, that you're resilient, and my goodness, has every student demonstrated resilient over the last two years, and that you are self-aware. You have that self-awareness to understand your own limited cognitive abilities and your own limits of information, and you're able to find ways to remediate that, and you can perform not just in the workplace but in life and contribute to communities. These pathways are going to open the door for so many more students to achieve that, and this is a great plan for the state of Louisiana. I'm excited about that and look forward to the work going forward as we start talking about institutional level specific admissions criteria. Because that is a little bit of a different conversation. It's one that we have to get right. We don't want to deny access to any student that could benefit from our work. And I'm, 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 I'm pleased to participate in that work with you, Commissioner, and be happy to answer any questions, sir. Thank you, sir. I don't have a question. I don't have a question, but I do want to express appreci appreciation um, because we've been at this work for at least a month and a half, two months. Uh, and as uh, Jim has mentioned, we've talked to every system president multiple times, answered questions multiple times. Jim in groups and one-on-one, -on -one, and Jim mentioned a couple of things that he said we need to have further conversation. Let's pass the policy today and then let's come back and have further conversation. So I appreciate the partnership and the, uh, of the, the willingness that you have had to, in all of the systems, to, to engage with us directly. Because that's how you get good work policy work done. As he mentioned, this is hard work, 
but it's about our students and, and fulfilling our talent development mission. So thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate it. Commissioner, and Mr. Chairman, I, uh, in the building right now, just down the hall from us, are the first two cohorts of the Reginald F. Lewis Scholars Program. I'm going to ask them to come in the room. I don't want to interrupt your work, but I do want you to put eyes on these 36 young men that are the future of the state of Louisiana. I want you to see them. They're all wearing uh, their shirts with a great logo on it. It is another example of how institutions that are focused on students can find ways to do things at levels that no one has done before. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, speak, speaking directly to that, I've shared with you multiple times how uh, I really want to get there to see you all in action with that Reginald F. Lewis uh, program. Uh, and also speaking to uh, Chairman Starnes and Supervisor uh, Warner's uh, comments, uh, as well as everybody's comments. Um, obviously, as much as I try to be, um, by, you know, just kind of bipartisan, uh, I am born and raised uh, as a, in Louisiana, first and foremost, right? But also as an LSU Tiger, right? And so uh, super excited to hear about the multiple successes that have happened uh, uh, there, uh, and, and then I just want to make a, a, a point, okay? I, I think we, we, we need to understand that we have an amazing Regents staff, okay? But we went and found, well, because the commissioner recruited and went and found that guy in the blue suit for a reason, and that was to do things that would otherwise seem like can we accomplish this? Can we do this? Are we going to better make this work, right? And he's here for the reason of exactly that, right? Uh, so I believe we can make it work. I believe we can put ourselves in a position where the flagship represents what it should and still is able to represent it in the best possible light, in the best possible way, uh, with also using the strengths and the uh, purposes of all of our other institutions and working together collaboratively um, and organically to make Louisiana accomplish the things that we want to accomplish, which ultimately comes down to having uh, a very educated, uh, diverse, uh, practically applicable a uh, group of people who can add value to our state and ultimately, let's be honest, at the end of the day, stay in the state and pay taxes, <laughs> okay? Um, which ultimately, I believe that's where we're all wanting to get. Uh, and if that's where we want to get, um, we all have the same thing in mind and I believe we have the people in place, right, with the gray matter and intelligence to be able to get us there. So that's where I am on it, uh, and I love the robust discussion uh, and the passion, uh, but I believe ultimately, and I may just be uh, overly naive or, um, you know, but I believe, I know we can get it done. Uh, what you started out saying, Tristan, this morning in our meeting over there was, he said, the goal of 2030, he said, he said I think we need to be careful about calling it a goal. Goal is something you may or may not hit. He said, we're going to accomplish this, right? I mean, you know, when you bring somebody, when they go get a superstar on a team, the person can't win it by themselves, but at the end of the day, you're going to put the ball in their hands and say, hey, get us there, right? Show us what we got to do to make it happen. I believe we got the people in place to better make it happen. So there we go. issue with me. Um, I grew up in Baton Rouge. I always wanted, like Collis, to be an LSU Tiger. It was an important part of my life. Unlike maybe some of the other institutions in the state, we have people all over this state that want to be, well, why don't we break and introduce these guys? Mr. Mr. Chairman and Madam Commissioner, uh, 
these are what I mentioned to you earlier. These are the Reginald F. Lewis scholars. They are uh, two members in each cohort from each one of our universities. Identified rising sophomore uh, that have shown that they have the grit, the determination, and the aptitude to be extraordinary students. Uh, the first cohort will be joining me and several others in Fe uh, in April uh, in Paris. Where we'll be attending lectures at the Sorbonne on the foundations of science, on the origins of democracy. Uh, they, are, they will be learning a little bit of French and a little bit of culture before they go. Uh, but these gentlemen are leaders in our communities, they're leaders in our, at our institutions, they're leaders in our state. They are led by the incomparable and inimitable Dr. Claire Norris. But these are the Reginald Lewis Scholars. Chairman, we, ex we accept emotional support and financial support for these scholars. <laughs> But if, if they're worried, if they're truly worried that people are not going to like go back to LSU, they could just go to LSU units first, which, which is a four thousand dollar tuition versus twenty two thousand dollar tuition. It's literally, uh, it's not that far from their regular campus. Just for the LSU problems. Maybe there's more problems, but I can't remember where I was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we see it uh, at this time of year on the LSU football team, all these great players that have come. And the reason is they, they believe, and Coach Kelly believes, that they're from Louisiana and they really always wanted to be at LSU. And this doesn't stop at the goal line. You know, this applies to a, I think, a great percentage of the students that come to LSU. Um, so I, I look at this, I know we're a policy making, well we are a policy making board. And this policy will affect individual students. And looking from that perspective, and I think it's more than one student, but if there were one student who said, I want to go to LSU and I want to get a degree and I'm not quite there, 
but I really want it bad. And LSU is willing to give that person a chance. Uh, a decision to take away this bridge, and it is a bridge. I'm for, I applaud all of these new pathways, but we're talking about taking away a pathway. This is a pathway for these students who it's not a choice between going to community college and going to LSU, and it's not going to Southern or going to LSU. It's a choice between going to LSU or going to college. That's what it is for them, or going out in the workforce. And so I can vote today for all of the new pathways, which I, I think it's great. I think they're great. I cannot vote today, personally, for a, a taking away a pathway. So that will be my vote. Maybe they can be split out because I think these new pathways ought to be put in there. Mr. Ch yeah. Committee Chair. I would move to, I'm a member of this committee, I'd move to, I'd move to defer action by the committee until we receive information regarding how many students in LSU are in the Summer Bridge program, how many students are in the Fall Bridge program, receive information or have a meet, Zoom, whatever, with Georgia State, Houston, and Memphis to see how we fund the gap of the Pell Grant students before we go further with this and get all the information on the table. We've heard from, we've heard, you know, from, uh, you know, the board. Are talking just that item B, or are you talking about the entire? Uh, I'm talking, I'm talking item B. Yeah, so your, your, your motion is to defer item B. Uh, yeah, the, about the, uh, about the summer bridge, fall bridge. So basically bifurcate the deal and just say, okay, we're going to take B out and move forward with the rest of it. Yes, and I just like, uh, I mean, for that committee to uh, dive deeper into the numbers and we just have a, a theory right now. We need, I, I would like to see the numbers of students that would affect and how it's paid for at the universities that were uh, casually mentioned that have the program. Right, and okay. and study it more. Is there a second to that motion to defer item B? Second. A second from Ms. Carter. Um, any further discussion or questions about deferring item B <coughs> and a vote on item B? Could I enter a substitute motion that the deferral be until the next meeting? I think because we can continue to kick this down the road, but I think we can t tick and tie this up in a matter of days and not in a month and so my substitute motion would be the deferral of item b to the next meeting agenda well well there's some specific <laughs> information i'm asking for so is it going to be given to us before the next meeting yes it would yeah it would have to be if you that's your have targeted around one institution and when I think about the totality of our students across the state and the many different universities that we've invested in I'm afraid that we're leaving them outside of this I've not heard one comment that talks about the students at the other institutions what happens to them in all of this and I have believed all along that what the board was proposing was for the interests of all of our students. Sure, LSU is very special, but I have every confidence that LSU can find a way to help those 700 students that most of our other school, other institutions in the state can't. And that is the central difference, Mr. Pryor, that I see between 
LSU and the rest of the college universe in, in Louisiana. Right. I appreciate that, of course, the Dr. Tarver. I've, you know, we just had the public comment section and, you know, I didn't see anybody from the other universities stepping up. So the only, the only issue that was brought forward to us was LSU's objection. That's why I, specific, I specified LSU. I don't hear the other college presidents didn't weigh in. Okay, so we have. But I don't know if they were invited, and, and, that, and I would have enlarged that to include information for all the other institutions. Well, President Henderson represents way. another university. System. Who's that? It is yeah. someone here. He spoke. We did have public comment, President yeah, Henderson. Yes, yes, I've heard. I'd like to hear from our new president of Southern yes, of University. Course. Welcome, Dr. Shields. Welcome. <laughs> so this is kind of exciting. <laughs> so you know, I, I, I left New York City to go to work in Wisconsin, and I thought I was leaving the big city and I'd go to a nice, calm place, and then they act, passed Act 10, and there were riots in the Capitol and everything. I come to Louisiana, and I seem to have precipitated a... Anyway, uh, I, I'm new enough here that I don't want to weigh in on, on all of this, uh, but uh, uh, the secretary and I had an exchange uh, earlier this week about some concerns I had about this, um, changing standards and making sure that it, it wouldn't disadvantage the students that we serve. Uh, and I'm convinced that the change in standards do that way. Um, I also have this saying, I'm seldom in doubt, uh, uh, but so I'll, I'll say what I think. Uh, if you're worried about Pell students and you're going to have a bridge program with them, you find the money to fund it without them worrying about that. That's the fundamental thing, okay? They, they, they are at, what, 125% of the poverty rate? If you're going to invite them to your campus and you're not going to fund them fully, then you're not really providing them an opportunity. And that's fundamentally. So I wouldn't suggest us expanding bridge programs on the campus of Southern University unless we could fully fund those students. And it's up to me to find the money to do that. So I, I find it a little disingenuous to worry about students that have high need and develop a program that you can't fund. That's just the way I think about it. So, I'll take any questions you have about that. But okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. I think we have a motion from uh, prior, and then a substitute motion or a request uh, to say that the next right, but never in doubt. To amend that motion to, to have us give this next one, assuming that we have the information. Information, sure. Chair, I have a question. Does the whole board vote on this or just the committee? You lost me. I'm sorry. What was the second part the again? The second motion. <laughs> Sound like the same motion. Item B and not hear item B this month, but to hear it next month. Just the committee level right now. Aren't they what the same thing? <laughs> What's the difference? Uh, they have to get some sort of motion to make it a one month period because it's just a regular motion. So it's going to be a little complicated. But right now, let's get the motion to defer item B. Motion passes at the committee level, and 
Second. Me and this me. <laughs> Just to clarify, we are hearing, if we have all the information, we're, we're going to vote on this next month, yeah, correct? Everything okay. was just approved except we defer item D for okay. next month. Thank you. Okay. So I have over to adjourn a second. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in opposition, here we go. Boy. is adjourned. It's a little confusing sometimes. Okay. Huh? A verbal boxing match. Like, ooh, it's getting spicy in here. I've had enough of this already. I don't know why that was so funny. <laughs> I've been doing this too long. <laughs> I don't Never need this. Yeah. I felt like he thought we were attacking, and I was just like, I'm just asking a question. I just thought we had to do this. <laughs> I was like, what's the point of community college? Well, Can we have recessed? <laughs> I don't see the clip. <laughs> to ask people to go there for summer bridge. Yeah. If they live somewhere else. Oh, Lord, mercy. I guess since I, I, Delgado, we don't have housing in the first place, so it's. Okay. Fireworks continue. Uh, where are we? Man, I'm lost. Okay. All right, so statewide programs. Uh, now statewide programs committee. Regent Ewing, can you call your committee to order, sir? Thank you, Chairman Temple. Uh, I do call the uh, non-controversial statewide <laughs> program committee to order. And I ask Dr. Butte to uh, please call the roll of the distinguished members. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> uh, Chair Ewing. Here. Chair McDonald. Uh, Vice Chair McDonald. Regent Finley. Regent Lobray. Here. Regent Meir. Here. Regent Pryor. I guess that's the end of it for me. Here, all members present, you do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Dr. Butte, please lead us into the consent agenda. Yes, sir. The first item on the consent agenda, our regents, would be rulemaking to implement the provisions of the regular session of the 2022 uh, Louisiana legislature. You can see at the bottom there are several different acts affecting uh, different scholarship and grants programs, and in your executive summaries and in the notes, these tell you what these items are. The next consent agenda item, you have three today. The second one is approval of TOPS exceptions. These are the exceptions that you're normally used to seeing with respect to failure to remain continuously enrolled and to earn the required academic hours during the year uh, for TOPS. The third consent agenda item is one that is relatively new. You have seen these before. Uh, this is a repeat of uh, some exceptions for the home study provision. These exceptions were passed by the Louisiana legislature before you could not make exceptions to these. And these are for students who presented the case as to why they could not spend the last two years of their high school career in a home study program. Uh, before, no matter what the circumstances were, those students would have been ineligible for TOPS because we had no way to be able to grant exceptions. The Law School Advisory Board has reviewed all of these consent agenda items and they recommend <coughs> approval of each one. Are there any questions, any discussion on the? Yes, sir. I'll go back to the courses that we're, that we're substituting or bringing in or approving. Yes, sir. Are, are those uh, lower academic, excuse me, are those lower academic uh, courses or is this downgrading the core curriculum in any way? No, sir, it is not. 
uh, when you look at the geometry, that's adding that to the TOPS Tech core, so I would actually say that that elevates this. Uh, when you look at the computer science courses, that would be, uh, then there was a lot of discussion about that, Regent McDonald, and I appreciate your question. That is computer coding. So at those higher levels, because we know that this matches demand for business and industry, so this adds those two courses as alternatives to foreign language. Uh, and then the uh, IDA provisions are the same hurricane exception provisions that you've done in the past for Laura Delta Zeta. So okay. no, sir, it does not. Thank you. Are there any other questions or discussion on the staff recommendation? If not, I receive a motion that we accept those recommendations. Okay, Regent McDonald moves first. A second. second. Okay. We got that. Okay, we'll move on to uh, agenda item four, which is to receive uh, the cost of college report. I think this will be of great interest to all of us. Should yes, be. Sir. We've been talking uh, about it for two hours. Exactly right. <laughs> I will try not to stir up controversy, but these are um, these are facts, right? So they are they are facts and opinions expressed by the students uh, that we have all expressed concern about. Uh, and I will tell you that listening to the comments from the system heads and from the LSU system, personally, LASFA does appreciate consideration for the students, particularly those who are limited income and who are underrepresented. We all have to keep them at the forefront in everything that we do. So one of the things that you ask us when we looked at the decline in those who are eligible for TOPS and then we looked at the decline in those who accepted the award even when they were determined eligible. You ask us to survey and try to start gauging student attitudes towards college and what they were thinking, and these are the results. Uh, 584 students were surveyed, so you had 12th graders, you had high school counselors, parents, TOPS recipients, as well as non-TOPS recipients. And the Vela Institute, which is an institute that's very well respected in the college access field, uh, worked with our team members to conduct this survey and to revise, devise the questions, sorry. So here's what they had to say. Uh, you're going to notice this is not unfamiliar to what you've been hearing all morning. Of the high school and post-secondary students, notice the vast majority of them aspire to attend college. The vast majority of them report that their parents help them in their decision. That is critical for college access professionals because what students are saying is it isn't what anybody else in this room is saying, it's what their family members are saying that's going to hold the most influence on whether they attend or not and where they attend. That's why the bottom is the kicker. 44.4% of the parents do not believe that college is an investment in their child's future. And 91.7% of those parents could not identify the lifetime uh, life earnings of college that college affords, which means they can't see the value proposition. When we fast forward a little bit, and I will try to do this quickly, but I think it's very important, um, Regent Ewing, as our chair, has a copy of this report, Gen Z's Higher Education Outlook, that was done by ECMC Foundation. They surveyed over 4,000 students. They surveyed them first in February of 2020, then they came back and surveyed them later in 2020, and then they surveyed them in 2021. The majority of those students, the, the amount of the value proposition from 2020 early 2020 to late 2020, decreased very little. From 2020 to 2021, that value proposition dropped by 23%. It dropped across income levels. Everybody, high, middle, and low. Now, the degree of variation was greatest among limited income students, but the bottom line is it dropped all across the board. Uh, we do have a link to that report. We can certainly get that to those of you that are, are, are interested. We have printed it out for our Regent Ewing, and I have an extra copy here for anybody who really wants to see it today. Well, but that survey is larger than this one, and the only reason I'm bringing it up today is because it affirms what we've seen in our state. 
And we will email that out to everyone. So Fantastic. That you get Thank you so much. Affordability. When you look at what students in Louisiana said, almost 48%, this is high school seniors, said they're going to struggle. 44% agree that even if they do get in, it's the same uh, issue that you just brought up, they're going to struggle to afford it. 42 and a half reported difficulty with the FAFSA. Remind, I'm reminding you, we are number one in FAFSA completion in the nation. But 42.5% of students report difficulty with the FAFSA. And you should see the comments that are trending on social media about why people think we shouldn't be asking them about their income at all. And why are we making them tell that? When you look at the national study, ECMC, 4,000 plus, 50% of Gen Z, it's 14 to 18 year olds, said they are most concerned about graduating with a high amount of debt. 64% said making higher education less expensive is the number one thing they want to change about it. Six out of 10 of those students surveyed worried about how they would pay for college. 65% said the amount of student loans is an important factor in their future education decisions. And 66% said the cost of tuition is an important factor. So again, Louisiana's 500 survey results are tracking those national results. When we looked at counselors and what they are saying, counselors wanted earlier information, information often about scholarships, cost of college, admissions requirements, they wanted resources that are easy to understand as early as possible such that they can counsel students on scholarship information, cost of college, and admissions requirements. The students said exactly the same thing. They said, we need you to connect college to career. We need to know about what we are studying and what job is there at the end of that credential. What difference is it going to make if I go and I want to know about options and not all of them are going to be a four year. I want to chart my own destiny. The recommendations are a bit difficult for you to read here, but I'll read these recommendations and then I have the ones from uh, the national study because they are tracking as well. First of all, invest in school and community-based uh, support personnel and parent-led counseling and outreach. Uh, at LASFA, we have the same budget to do outreach for K-12 and adults in all segments. It's going to take every one of us to be able to work to do the outreach to help students and families understand the value of a college uh, degree and to navigate the college-going process. Affordability. Direct, targeted outreach and mailings about college affordability. Um, these are targeted to families early and often. So again, the recurring theme here is early and often, and how do you begin to shape those perceptions about affordability and the value proposition about affordability? Timeline, no change here. Communicate financial aid estimates before May 1st. We have a budget year that means we don't get an appropriation from the legislature until June. Colleges are sending out fee bills and packaging well in advance of that. So how do we come to a place where we are showing students if you do A, B, and C, again, remember, clarity in the admissions requirements and clarity in how that relates to financial aid. Because just because you are admitted does not mean you're going to get the financial aid that you think you are. If you have a 2.25 or you have a 2.0, you may get in. You will not get tops in its current format. So again, what we're working with is taking that, right, and seeing how can we position that as an advising tool for counselors, middle school and high school, parents and students in a way where they can look at that and easily understand. You must meet these requirements, but you must also meet these requirements because if you don't, you may get in, but then you may have a surprise when you get that fee bill and you thought one 
equated to the other. So we will begin, we will be working hand in hand. Our staff is already working on a crosswalk of the admissions chart. What do the national recommendations say? Provide information. Educators must actively provide information about the variety of post-secondary pathways and highlight the benefits of each. Support learners. Actively disseminate information and resources connecting students with help they need to understand and pursue their desired path. Remember in the national st uh, survey, students said, I want to choose my own path. I feel a lot of pressure to attend a four year, but that may not be what I wanna do. So I want to be able to choose. Prioritize skills over degrees. Uh, Regent Perez, totally on point. Regent May, totally on point. Regent Finley, totally on point. Employers must shift their mindset to better connect the skills learners have gained from their education, education with their future jobs over prioritizing degree attainment. Investing in the future. Gen Z made it clear that they expect employers to have skin in the game which could provide upskilling educational opportunities, tuition reimbursement or assistance. Provide holistic support. LASPA has initiated a student engagement division just for this purpose. To be successful, students need supports that are not only academic, but that also address their basic needs. I believe that someone from Southern talked about that as well. Uh, food, transportation, mental well-being, and technology, which is becoming valuable in today's remote education environment. And the last one, which is on point with your master plan, legitimize credentials. Federal and state level support for non-four-year pathways can help Gen Z's desire for more focused, affordable education by expanding government support for these types of programs and improving public awareness of the middle class careers available to graduates. The loss of advisory board has reviewed this as well. Uh, once we looked into this whole, uh, and this report is called questioning the quo. In other words, these students are questioning the status quo. And we learned that it is not only one report, it's an entire movement and campaign. We have reached out to MCA's, uh, ECMC's foundation that developed this report. A meeting will be scheduled. We're in the process right now of scheduling a meeting this week to figure out how we can utilize their resources combined with our resources and educate our advisory board, our college access professionals, the counselors we train, and in so doing, know better, do better with colleges and our college partners and our parents and our students. So we ask that you uh, do a motion to accept this report. Are there any questions? This is a good report. It stays with a the theme that uh, we've all been concerned about and that is the affordability. And is it within the reach of our average family <clears throat> in this state uh, when you consider the low family income and the cost of going, and we know we had some information about two years ago that showed all the different grants that are available and then showed that there was still a sizable gap insofar as the amount of money it would take for a student to go to school. Looks like it was about $20,000 for the average at all our universities. And the grants, the GO grants, the Pell, TOPS, and all covered maybe 60, 65 percent. So affordability is something that is going to stay at the forefront. I don't know exactly how we handle it all, but we better keep it on the front burner because when you look at how many students in this state, and there were some remarkable numbers given this morning about the number of students that go to school and the number of students that finish school. So um, if, if you don't have any questions to Dr. Butte, I'm gonna move, uh, move that we accept the report. I don't think it takes an action though to accept the report, does it? Do you want one? I don't think so. That's fine. Anyway, we're gonna accept it. Um, does everybody feel good about it? <laughs> okay, we're gonna accept it then. That's great. All right. Okay, we go on to the next agenda item. Yes, sir. Under other business, we wanted to give you an update on two new programs, the MJ Foster Promise Program as well as the Go Teach Program. So 
So far, I have these numbers and then I have some hot off the press numbers from today. Uh, we have 4,647 total applicants for this program. For those of you who may be a little bit less familiar, this focuses on two-year institutions. So it's LSUE, Southern and Shreveport, and the LCTCS system. And then it focuses on proprietary schools. Under the law, it is limited to 500K at a maximum for proprietary schools that offer eligible coursework, and these are in top demand occupations, and 10 million for the eligible public two-year institutions, which I've mentioned. When we launched this website, this work started around November, we had two work groups. A work group on the procedures for MJ Foster involving representatives from each of those uh, entities, and a work group on marketing. Um, when we launched the website, it was agreed that LASFA was a neutral party, meaning we aren't going to put up a website that says, you just go here. That's not our job. Our job is to say, this is a program, this is the eligibility, the students should go where they're matched best. So when we put that neutral website up, it eclipsed TOPS as the record number of page views. That is very hard to do at LASFA, particularly when you get to the spring semester where folks are going to want to know, I got my fee bill, I got my acceptance letter, where's my tops? So there is interest in it. We had 4,647 applicants, I would say, within a matter of months. Uh, at that time, 3,186 uh, 3, were eligible and 1,461 were ineligible. Of those students that were ineligible, all of those numbers across, we have something called a master roster. And a master roster is very familiar to financial aid professionals. It says, if you're an eligible institution, you can look at this roster, which comes independently from LASFA. If a student is on there, they are eligible for you to pay them. This means the student can start over here and go over here or go over here, and you don't have an issue of, well, since you transferred, nobody knows if you're eligible. So the master roster can be seen by all. There are codes on the roster. If a student is eligible, the campus will see that, 2,778 eligible. If a student is funded eligible, they're going to see that, 2,714. If a student is eligible but they are waitlisted, then the campus is going to see eligible waitlisted. If a student is ineligible, the campus is going to see that student and they're going to see a code that tells them why. Like student already has an associate's degree. Student was incarcerated. Student's not incarcerated anymore, but they uh, were convicted of a violent crime. Student didn't fill out the FAFSA. Student doesn't meet the income requirement. Now, why is all of that important? Because it gives the campuses the tools that they need to say, if that student isn't eligible for this particular program, but you know that you on your campus have institutional aid or other pilot programs that that student could be eligible for, then it is incumbent upon you to connect them. And we got the question, well, how do you connect them? If you just see the roster, do you give their names and addresses? We do not, because students do not give us their information for anyone else to solicit their participation. So here's how we devised a method to do that. Let's say a campus, any one of those campuses comes to us and says, I am interested in connecting. I have a, we're not shaming anybody into having anything. I have aid that I want to offer students that may be ineligible or some of these students that may be waitlisted. We have an email already drafted, a link already ready, and it would say, hey, your campus has additional aid that they could offer you. Click here to connect. It could say click here to connect with LCTCS, click here to connect with LSUE, click here to connect with Southern and Shreveport. You could connect with all three. This way, no one's violated any privacy laws because the student has elected to share that information with the campus as they do when they fill out the FAFSA and as they do when they apply. So that's a standard process. So as of today, let's see, we have 2,787 eligible. We have 1,501 
ineligible and a grand total of 4,778, which means these numbers are increasing. Um, what happens when they are eligible? And a notice goes out from LASFA that tells that student that they are eligible and gives them the enrollment requirements. There is a deadline of January 30th, right, of 2023, meaning you can't just get in line and hold a spot and not enroll. Because when you get in line, we are reserving dollars for you. And if you hold on to dollars indefinitely, you are stopping another student who's ready to attend immediately from attending. Because this is, it's a legally binding 10.5. It isn't a you can fudge. That's not what statute does. So we have to live within our means unless the legislature appropriates more. So after, what happens if you don't enroll January, by January 30th, 23rd, you're dropped, you're not on the wait list, and you have to reapply, meaning you lose your spot in line. Why do you do a spot in line? The law says, MJ Foster shall be first come, first served. So when applicants came to our website to apply, and when they were deemed eligible, LASFA's programming deemed them eligible in rank and time order. So that way we know we're conforming with the spirit of the law, that requirement, and serving students and connecting um, campuses. Questions? Quick question. How many dollars are committed so far? 10.5 is the amount that's no, committed that you've from committed the legislature. To students. Do you know how much you've committed we to We will students? not know that until the earliest we will know that is September 9th. So we're going to keep you all updated, and here's the reason. The 14th class day is a common billing deadline that we use in financial aid. Why do you use that? Because if you pay somebody state dollars or federal, it's been tried, and they don't stick around, that's a problem. So we say if that student is still enrolled as of the census day, campuses bill on. Now, those are for academic programs. If campuses have non-credit programs that have shorter census days, then those people can be billing right now. So we are going to our first major check. It's going to be September 9th because to your point, Regent Sterling, if you gotta live within your means, you better keep checking that dollar. Because at any point in time, if we get to say, huh, <laughs> you've used up the majority of your money and you're just out of the fall semester, you can't make it till the spring. The law says, not LASFA, the law says, you will handle a shortfall by first come, first serve, and you will allow those in first come, first serve order to complete what they are doing. So you have to have a fail safe, you have to watch it, meaning I could be eligible funded, and if there's a shortfall, I would be moved to a wait list. And then what will we be able to say to the legislature when they convene? So you gave us this pot of money. We spent this much. We have to obligate to be able to let these students finish. And we've got these hanging out there that are waiting for more funding. So this program is very popular. But you go in with data that says this is how much. There were folks that said at the legislature and we cringed every time they said it. MJ Foster is fully funded. You don't know what fully funded is. You haven't implemented it. You have a guess, right? Now comes the what does fully funded mean? So we will keep you apprised as we do with TOPS. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, first, I just want to thank you, Dr. Booty, and you, Commissioner Reed. I know uh, there was a, a backlog on the wait list, and, yes, and you uh, guys did yeoman work in getting that number whittled down. I know as recently as our last board meeting, that number was much higher. Can you talk about that, what the wait list means, and how you were able Certainly to resolve that? Thank you. The backlog on the wait list and the controversy ensuing it was the, comes from the fact that you have to live within your means. So it's limited to and you'll have to really listen carefully to follow this, $6,400 over a period of three years. You're eligible for $3,200 in one year. But if you take a high cost course, like a CDL driving course, or let's say we had an aviation course or a really high health care course, you could expend 
your entire 6,400 in the first year. Remember that first come first serve, you shall allow them to finish. So it gives you a dilemma of, okay, the most conservative approach was to reserve 64, which created a very large wait list and a lot of angst. The Board of Regents looked at that and said, yeah, okay, let's back off of that and let's reserve 3,500. So 35 is what, 32 plus a little bit of wiggle room in case, because you don't know how many students are going to take high cost courses. A student could take a high cost course in the fall and a high cost course in the spring and 86 this money out and then where are you? So that change in the amount that was reserved for students is what dropped the wait list for the publics to 64. For the proprietary schools, the regents made the decision to leave their reservation at 6,400 because those are typically higher cost institutions and our team does not have a history like this. With TOPS, that would have been a no-brainer because the TOPS award is this. You go on the website, you look, you attend that institution, that's your award. That's easy to do. This isn't because the tuitions vary. So again, my understanding is if the regents get data that says, okay, we can reduce that reservation amount for proprietary schools, which have a significantly smaller amount to pull from, and their wait list was 400% of availability. I think the public's was, yeah, a little over 100, less than 200%. So that's the story of the wait list. That's the collaborative effort that we were able to use to drop it, and now we all have to watch, 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 uh, and, uh, and keep reporting to you. Any other questions? It's just one more. Yeah. And do we have any sense of, of the 4,600 plus applicants? Uh, are they new students coming in for the first time? Do we, do we know if, if Foster is attracting new students who had not been in, in our programs? We do not know okay. that. Okay. Now, I would say that that's better determined by the campuses because once they see that student on the master roster, they're going to be able to see, oh, hey, have you already enrolled that student before? Did they have some credits and they return? But if that student has, I will do a caveat for you. If that student has already completed an associate's, they're not going to be eligible for MJ Foster. So from that perspective, it wouldn't be those students coming back for this pot of money. It would be nice to know if we're attracting new people in because of Foster. Yes, and we will let the, uh, we have the work group meetings every other Tuesday, Robin, yes. and we will let them know that that question was asked so campuses can begin that capacity to track that. And then we can report it to you all. Okay, any other questions? Do we have any students that um, we've already made a commitment to that we're not going to be able to honor? At this particular point in time, we do not. But that does not mean that if, and that's that whole phenomenon of, we have 64 on the wait list right now for the publics. That total that you see on the wait list, that over 400 is public plus proprietary. We will have to continue to monitor the expenditures. If the expenditures fall short of the amount of money available, then the only students you can let complete are those who were first in line in ranked order. So at this point in time, we're okay, but we're going to keep monitoring as the billings come in and keep you all up to date. And so <clears throat> we feel like that will be well understood by the applicant and the student. Yes, but, sir. We okay. are making particularly, again, when we had the 6,400, you didn't have to do that legal qualifier for the ones that were funded eligible because you knew. You open up that wait list, there's a, a, a legalese requirement on there that's very similar to what we do for TOPS. <clears throat> TOPS funding is contingent upon appropriations, which means if I run out, there's going to be a problem, but I have to let you know that up front, because if not, someone could say you gave that student a legal property right to that money, pony up, and LASFA does not print money, and we don't have <clears throat> any more in the closet. Well, we hope that doesn't happen, but I do think if we made a commitment <laughs> to a student and they started down the road, we need to help them finish, but I don't think it takes three years to learn how to drive a truck. <laughs> Sir, they, they could use that one up short. They can come drive a log truck quicker than that. All right, any, any other questions? Okay. Are you through with your presentation? 
Almost. No, I'm sorry. Uh, the Go Teach slide is the last one. This is a new program in response <clears throat> to the teacher shortage. Uh, it will be implemented this fall. Uh, as most of you know that are very experienced in higher education. If we are just, uh, we are waiting right now on the Revenue Estimating Committee in September when they meet to recognize this fund. Now, what does that mean to those of you at the campuses? Huh, students have already paid fee bills. We feel you. Financial aid offices have already packaged students. So here comes the very first question from financial aid offices when you say, guess what? I am going to give you new money that is last dollar to students, and you've already disseminated loans, and they've paid their bill. The first thing they want to know is, hey, before they fuss at you really loudly, are you going to allow refunds? Meaning, student has a play payment plan at the bursar's office. Are you going to say, these dollars can go in and stop the payment plan and pay the rest with this? Student paid with a credit card. Refund the credit card, pay that balance with this. So that is allowing refunds and allowing students to use these dollars. Our staff has been working very diligently to implement MJ Foster, take away the wait list, and implement the programming for Go Teach so that immediately after revenue estimating recognizes this 1.25 million, we will be ready uh, for schools to be able to start billing for students. Know that in financial aid land we call this, or college access uh, we, land we call this somewhat of a last dollar program. So is MJ Foster. That is going to become more and more important to you as you get deeper into this. That means if you had TOPS, if you had a Pell Grant, if you had any other aid, these dollars come in after that. Now you can exclude loans from that, you can exclude work study from that, and we do that. What that does is when you do a last dollar program like that and you say you can't get the, this money unless you've, until we've accounted for all the other dollars, and you can only get these, this money to pay for tuition and fees and maybe books and supplies. When Regent Ewing told you about that cost gap, that is in tuition, fees, and books and supplies. That's room and board, that's any materials, and that's transportation costs. Last dollar programs such as these do not apply towards those. So why do you do, why do policymakers tend to do this? Because they want to take this pot of money and see if they can't spread it out. So that is that philosophy, that is what this is. So why, that's why the refunds are even more important because if those students have borrowed money to go to school and teach your education, and you've got this money, you wouldn't be able to expend it in the fall at all at this point if you didn't allow refunds. So we are ready and we are uh, getting the promotional material out as soon as the funding is recognized <coughs> to be able to work with uh, departments of education. We've already had conversations to launch the program. And that will do it. Are there any questions, any discussion? I do think on this particular uh, report that covered these, I would like to see a motion that we accept this report in a second. So moved. Got a, got a motion, need a second. Did it, Regent Finley, did you do the motion? Okay. Okay, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Unopposed, motion carries. Thank you, and thank you for that report. Okay, now we just need a motion to adjourn. That's, a, that, that's usually a pretty easy one. Um, <laughs> have a motion that we adjourn. Got a second? Okay. Got absolutely no objection. Do the second? All right, all right. So thank you for that. Thank you for you all. Thank you for that. So uh, what we want to do right now is shift gears a little bit um, uh, so we can try to uh, get our, a couple of our special guests up to the front and uh, hear from them. And then if they decide they want to eat with us, great. And if not, we'll, we'll move accordingly. We don't want to hold them up. So right before planning and research, I am going to introduce um, uh, to everyone, reintroduce to everyone. Um, you know, over the summer, our colleagues at the Southern University System welcomed a new president to Baton Rouge uh, to lead the Jaguar Nation. Uh, and that is Dr. Dennis Shields, everyone. 
Uh, and Dr. Shields is a native of Iowa and earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Graceland College as well as a Juris Doctorate from the University of Iowa College of Law. Uh, and prior to joining us here in the capital city, he served as the chancellor for the Wisco University of Wisconsin Platteville for nearly 12 years, spending most of his career advocating for what we have been talking about heavily this morning, uh, which is better access to higher education, especially those who have been underrepresented. Uh, he is a champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion and serves as the first chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group for the NCAA Division III. He joined us after uh, this afternoon, well, he would have been, he hopefully will still stay for lunch uh, if he has the time, um, but uh, we've obviously invited him to address the board publicly and share his vision uh, for Southern University system, its students, alumni, uh, and our community at large, and how he sees Southern joining forces with us to develop talent here in Louisiana. Um, President Shield, we, 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 we welcome you to the Board of Regents uh, and, and by no means to, uh, to water down your introduction, uh, we're just going to knock out two birds with one stone and we didn't mean to, uh, maybe we should have placed her in the middle of you two, right? <laughs> Uh, because uh, with uh, the, the Bayou Classic, we just we starting it early, right? So we want to thank Dr. Shields, but I obviously am very uh, equally excited to welcome back to the Board of Regents uh, Grambling State University President Rick Gallo. Uh, Grambling recently announced a significant achievement in talent development in Regents uh, William Brown. Uh, Williams Brown and I wanted to highlight the historic accomplishment um, uh, for the state kick off their fall semester before they kick off their fall semester. So first of all, we'll have, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you to speak President Shields and then we'll have uh, President Gallo to speak. Good afternoon. I'm a lawyer by training and it's always a dangerous thing to give a lawyer a captive audience. So lunch will be a little later today. <laughs> Just, uh, and I, I was going to talk a little bit about my background, but uh, I think I'm going to just forge ahead into what I'm about. A lot, a lot of my sense uh, about the role and the mission of higher education formed long, long time ago, and, and every once in a while I come across a document that confirms it and, and um, re-energizes me and alerts me to thinking about it in a different way. And um, uh, Commissioner Reed sent a, a document a little while ago that sort of echoed this one, but it's the value proposition that was done with Gates money, but it's fascinating. And it speaks to the population of students that are, make up a large portion of the students at Southern, but certainly across the system. And it notes that these students are needed to be educated if this country is going to prosper. And so for me, they pointed out how the cost of higher education is not just tuition and fees, but it's room and board. And at most public institutions, the other costs are more than what tuition and fees might be. And so I, one of the projects I'm going to work on with the Jaguar Nation is maybe trying to reduce the amount of debt our students take on, recognizing that need. But the, I have assigned my team on campus, um, three sort of major themes, um, and having worked in a system and, and, and know that um, what you want is the broad outlines and the general goals, but you don't want somebody else managing you, I'm going to let each of my campuses and, and units figure it out. But number one, uh, when I first looked at the opportunity to come to Southern, I looked at the iPads data that spoke to the student outcomes. And they're not as they should be. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on front and center. So we want to improve our retention from first year to second year. We want to improve our persistence through. And we want to improve our graduation rates. And a lot, there's a lot of work to be done that way. Uh, but I have charged each of our campuses with thinking about what they want to accomplish this year in that frame. I, I also know you got to do things you can't have 17 goals right in a year you, you got to keep it simple so that's number one and that that will color everything we do 
Number two, I've discovered, even over the short time I've been here, that Southern is actually very engaged with the community in a variety of ways. But I believe that universities should be stewards of place. They should help the region, the state where they're located, thrive and improve the lives of everyone and, and help it succeed both economically, socially, uh, healthily. And so I've charged our campuses with two things on that front. Number one, to be even more committed to those kinds of things and find ways to, to help our community succeed. But number two, what I've discovered is we do a very poor job of letting our stakeholders know the level of our engagement. So I want them to do both. I want them to be more engaged with our communities, where, where our campuses are located, but I want them to make sure that the word is getting out in an organized way and that as a system we can help them do that. The third theme is we have a whole range of stakeholders. And you know, I started hearing from stakeholders, I think the, the Southern uh, Board of Supervisors, I think it was February 18th, and by, I think that happened around noon, and by one o'clock I was hearing from stakeholders across the country. And what I've discovered is they're very passionate stakeholders, alumni, uh, business and industry, all kinds of people who are very excited about being engaged with Southern and helping Southern succeed and having Southern help them succeed. So the third theme is to reach out to those stakeholders and, and strengthen our commitment. I especially want to focus on business and industry. Since I've been here, uh, I've, I've talked with, I won't, I won't call them out, but representatives and actually within the next couple of days, another representative, Fortune 500 companies located in Baton Rouge who've called me up and said, we want to work with you, but we want to see your campus execute on some things. And so we have to work with those stakeholders to help us fund bridge programs in the summer maybe, okay? To create co-ops and internship experiences for our students. To engage our students when they're freshmen and sophomores, not just when they're seniors and looking for employment. To fund student organizations, to fund travel, to fund other ways to, to be engaged. Um, fortunately, Southern has alumni that play a major role in many of those companies and are very excited about us being engaged. So I, I'm not going to prattle on, but if, if you want to know what I'm focused on, student outcomes, um, stewards of place for our campuses, and engaging our stakeholders. And we'll build from that foundation. Thank you very much, Dr. Shields. Uh, excited about you getting started, excited about uh, the things that you'll uh, lead in the process of making happen at uh, the only HBCU system in the United States. Um, President Gallo. Well, good afternoon, uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and all the members of the uh, Board of Regents. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to say a few words uh, to you this afternoon. Certainly want to, uh, again, publicly congratulate uh, President Shields uh, as he's uh, taken on leadership at Southern University. I certainly understand uh, uh, looking at the iPads data coming in as a, as a new president, uh, how daunting that can, can look, but I certainly want to uh, thank this board for, uh, for supporting Grambling State University and providing us the, the empowerment we needed to uh, to, to improve a lot of those, those areas. So whether it was supporting the reopening of our uh, School of Nursing, which of course was number one on my list, not just because my wife was a three-time graduate of that program, uh, but because it was uh, a program that, uh, that, that is um, you know, very near and dear to, uh, to all of us at Grambling. And so um, I do wanna pause because of course, with uh, the recent news that our uh, School of Nursing graduates had 100% of the graduates to pass NCLEX. <laughs> Before I go any further, I want to pass the, the microphone over to uh, Dr. Meg Brown, who is the Dean of our, our School of Nursing, uh, because you know, as much as the President gets the, the credit, I, I deserve none of it, because uh, Dr. Brown and, and her team uh, over at the School of Nursing have, have really been intentional about uh, making it possible for, for these graduates to be successful. So I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Meg Brown who will, will share a couple of words on behalf of the School of Nursing. Good afternoon everyone. 
I feel like I have come full circle since going through the process of starting a new BSN program at Graham State University. And it was indeed uh, President Gallo's, one of his main goals when he took over the presidency. We hope we did you proud. Good. Uh, we really appreciate the Board of Regents' trust in us to start a new program because I remember that last step, we had to go through many to uh, get the approval and listening to the Board of Regents, which was our last step before we went back to the Board of Nurse and give us that approval, uh, really lifted us to where we needed to be. So the program so far um, is accredited and it was accredited when the first student walked across the stage. That was important to us. Uh, we, uh, our next goal was to get full state approval and that required getting that 80%. So, President Gallo, you have your School of Nursing, the BSEM program. It is accredited, it has full state approval and we will continue to work toward increasing the number of nurses in our profession as well as enhancing and improving the diversity as well. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And, and let me also say, uh, this, this is somewhat of a full circle moment for me as well. Um, my first Board of Regents meeting as president, uh, we were placed on fiscal watch uh, because our finances were not uh, where, they, uh, where they needed to be. And I'm certainly uh, proud to say that uh, in this six year time span, we have uh, more than doubled that score. We've increased it over 200%. Uh, from where we were uh, back in, in 2006. Our audits have been clean. And of course, because of the support of, uh, of this body, uh, to be the first and only school in the state of Louisiana to offer a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity, first and only uh, school in the state of Louisiana to offer a bachelor's degree in cloud computing, those programs have, have really opened doors that, uh, that, that we could, could only dream about six years ago, and, uh, but again, it, it required the support of, of so many of you in here and, and others who uh, served before you who uh, made those uh, uh, program openings uh, possible. We've seen about a 20% increase in, in enrollment over the last uh, six years. We've seen increases in first to second year retention rate. Uh, we've seen increases in our, in our graduation rate. All the objective areas that, uh, that, that we uh, look to improve upon, uh, we have seen increases there, but there is still work to do and uh, we, we certainly uh, appreciate, again, the continued support of, of all of you. Uh, the last thing I, I will say, uh, Bayou Classic tickets are on sale. <laughs> All right, and, and I, I, I sat next to my friend intentionally because, uh, you know, right now we're at peace. Uh, there, there's, only, uh, there, there's only one day of the year that, uh, that, that we're not at peace, uh, but we want to fill the stadium up because obviously for every ticket that is sold, uh, it means additional revenue uh, back to the two universities that is so uh, sorely needed. So uh, it's kind of like WWE, you know, we're... Uh, we, we, we claim to, to be foes, but uh, in fact, as the, the two public HBCUs in the state of Louisiana, we have very important work to do, and uh, I certainly look forward to uh, working with President Shields as we go forward uh, and finding uh, those programs that we may uh, find synergy in, in working together, and we've already identified a couple of them. And so, uh, again, I, I look forward to working with him and supporting him in any way I can, except for the last Saturday of November <laughs> of, of each year. Uh, Madam Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, we'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. If not, I don't want to stand between uh, all of you and, and lunch. And Judy Brown would not be happy with me on that one. Just want Sir. to acknowledge Dr. Brown and the incredible work of leading the Gremlin program. It has been a labor of love for her. Um, and I know the hard work that she has put into uh, rebuilding that program. So congratulations. Welcome, Dr. Shields, to um, Louisiana. And we're looking for great things. There are lots of people cheering you on and here to help you. And she's a product of, of Southern, too. So, uh, yes, we all have a... Uh, yeah, and I do as well. So, again, we're, we're, we're family except that one day. <laughs> Tickets are on sale, if I didn't mention that. <laughs> Thank both of you all for being here. Appreciate it so much. Thank you. Regents, we are going to forge on, and uh, we're going to get through this planning, research, and performance. We're not going to rush, but we will move expeditiously. <laughs> uh, planning, research, and committee, 
Um, uh, Regent Sterling, if you can please call your committee to order. Yes, and we will move forward expeditiously. So I'll ask Ms. Britton to please call the roll. Yes, ma'am. Regent Sterling? Here. Regent Williams Brown? Here. Regent Finley? Here. Regent Levy? Here. Regent McDonald? Here. Regent Perez? Here. Regent Pryor? Here. Regent Weil? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. We will now move to item three, the consent agenda. Okay, our first consent agenda item today is the licensure of academic schools. We have six license renewals today, starting with Alcorn State University, a public institution based in Natchez, Mississippi, providing nursing degrees to Louisiana students. Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, a private institution headquartered in Daytona, Florida. This provides various aeronautical related degrees to Louisiana students at Barksdale Air Force Base. San Joaquin Valley College, private junior college with 15 campuses in California. They do not currently have students enrolled in Louisiana. United States University, a private for-profit university in San Diego, California. They offer a various 26 academic programs available available for Louisiana students. Upper Iowa University is a private university headquartered in Fayette, Iowa. They offer classroom and laboratory instruction at five different Louisiana locations in Alexandria, Baton Rouge, Derrida, Fort Polk, and New Orleans. And Walden University, an online for-profit university headquartered in Minnesota that currently has 160 academic programs available for Louisiana residents. Um, and they have 514 Louisiana students enrolled. Next, uh, on the consent agenda, we have the proprietary schools recommendations from the Proprietary School Commission. We had five change of ownership applications this commission. These were all one school or owned by a single entity and bought by a single entity. We also had five new school applications from various parts around the state. Then we had 21 um, new or renewal applications for proprietary schools. In addition to all these renewal applications, we have two other items. The approval of final rulemaking. This initial rulemaking was brought to you at the last meeting. This is to update the proprietary school forms for increased efficiency and agility, as well as alignment with upcoming online program implementation. And the last item on the consent agenda is the appointment to Advisory Commission on Proprietary Schools. Uh, Commissioner Reed has recommended the appointment of Mr. Chris Broadwater. Mr. Chris Broadwater was the Vice President for Workforce Policy at LCTCS for four years, and during that last year actually served on the commission as their appointment. So we will be happy to welcome him back if you so choose. I believe that is our last consent agenda and senior staff recommends that the board approve the items on the consent agenda. Thank you, Ms. Britton. Members, are there any questions? You've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda? I move approval. Motion by Perez and second by um, Judy Williams Brown. Any discussion or any further questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed, nay? Motion passes. Ms. Britton, you can move on to the, um, I get. Yes, Ms. Or maybe Golden. It's, yes. Ms. Golden is going to present on the uniform policy. So Regents uh, Policy Advisor Brianna Golden will present the amendments to the uniform policy on power base violence. Thank you, Regent Sterling. Um, Members, staff is recommending three changes to the uniform policy on power-based violence that was passed last year during a special August board meeting. We propose the following changes to the uniform policy to remain consistent with state law. First, uh, we'll be on page 26 of the uniform policy. Uh, this calls for removal of the section titled Sex Crime Data Report, which requires each institution's campus police department to submit by February 15th with each year a report containing certain information required by law to the Louisiana Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Criminal Justice. 
The change doesn't remove the legal requirement for institutions to report this information. Rather, it recognizes that Regents isn't responsible for enforcement or oversight of this requirement or the resulting reporting. The second uh, recommended change comes actually at the behest of one of the Regents. It's the insertion of two additional columns. The first would be to list the category of offenses, whether the offense is a Title IX offense or a power-based violence offense. And secondly, uh, to list the time it took to resolve the complaint. And that change will occur on page 34 of the uniform policy. Lastly, it's an update to the, def to the definition of the term employee to reflect the revision included act in Act 689 of the 2022 regular legislative session which reads, an employee does not include a student enrolled in a public post-secondary institution whose employment is contingent upon enrollment as a student unless the student works for the institution in a position such as a teaching assistant or a residential advisor. And that page uh, would be, that change would occur on page 30 in the uniform policy which, policy, which is listed in the appendix. And senior staff recommends approval of the amendments to the uniform policy on power-based violence. Thank you. Any questions? Do I have a motion to approve the amendments to the Uniform Policy on Power-Based Violence? So moved. Mo moved and second by Regents Perez and Regents Finley. Any other discussion and questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Is there any other business to come before the Planning, Research, and Performance Committee? No, ma'am, there's not. Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. And second. Any questions? Any discussion? All in favor of adjournment? Any opposed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Now, we will actually, you all, do the personnel committee over lunch. So, that being, no, we will not. Okay. <laughs> so, there has been an audible called on the audible that I just called, okay? We can knock it out? Lunch is in here and you're in another room for okay. personnel, so I don't know if you want to eat just quickly and then All right, so we'll just eat very quickly and then go to personnel. Is that what we're saying? We gotta go to the room unless you want everybody to eat in here. Lunch okay. Wait. That's fine. Are y'all good with that or y'all just want to push through? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, listen, I appreciate you saying what everybody else was thinking, okay, right? But that's what you call an audible on top of the audible. So let's go eat, and then we're going to throw it to Regent Pryor for personnel. Personnel committee. Next up is personnel committee. I move that we go into executive session. Second. Okay. Well, Regent Pryor, okay. I guess you call the committee to order after. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Let's see. So, Regent Pryor, you want to call your committee to order? I'd like to call the personnel committee meeting to order. Mr. LeBriar, will you call the roll? Yes, sir. Regent Pryor? Here. Regent David? Here. Regent Levy? He was, he was here. here. <laughs> He's here. Regent May? Here. Regent Meir? Regent Seal? <coughs> Regent Sterling? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Matthew. LeBriar rounds with Pryor. <laughs> okay, let's see. We're going to do the uh, first on our item. First item on our agenda is the annual assessment of our commissioner. Matthew, will you please explain the process? 
Yes, sir. Uh, so each year we conduct an evaluation of the Commissioner of Higher Ed Education. This is a 360 degree performance evaluation consisting of a self-assessment a self and planning session, a board assessment of the Commissioner, and an evaluation session. Uh, the Personnel Committee carries out this function at the direction of the Personnel Committee Chair. For the self-assessment, the Commissioner provides reflections on the past year based on measures outlined in the previous plan and provides goals and opportunities for improvement in the upcoming year. This document is then submitted to the committee members individually for review. For the board assessment, committee members provide feedback and comments through a survey instrument. The committee chair then provides an analysis of the evaluation to the committee members. And finally, for the evaluation session, the committee engages with the commissioner, as we're doing today, um, and once the committee has completed its business, the board will vote on the committee's recommendation. Uh, lastly, I'd like to add that since this is a personnel item, the board may choose to go into executive session pursuant to RS 4216. Commissioner Reed has been given written notification of the executive session as is required under RS 4217A1 and has agreed to a private discussion. As you know, no action can be taken nor any voting or polling conducted conducted during executive session. The executive session is for discussion purposes only. While this is an executive session of the personnel committee, other members of the board are allowed to be present for the discussion. All right. Is there a, a second to the motion? Okay. Matthew, can you please call the roll for a, a voice vote? Yes, sir. Regent Pryor? Yes. Uh, Regent David? Regent Levy? Yes. Regent May? Yes. Regent Meir? Yes. Regent Seal? Yes. Re uh, Regent Sterling? Yes. Okay, the motion does pass. Thank you. We will now go into executive session. Audience members, please stay seated. And we're going to move to the marble room. And, and Blake will lead us to the marble room in the red, beautiful jacket. I don't know where it is. You can come even though we're not on the yes. Yeah, every, every board member can come. Public agenda. Motion. Okay, moved. thank you. Okay. Motion by Mr. May and S Temple, S seconded by Mr. May. Okay, no action, no voting, or no polling occurred during our executive session. At this time, do I have a Motion to conclude our executive session and resume our public agenda. That was the motion, okay. <laughs> Any discussion or objections? Matthew, can you please call the roll for a, a voice vote? Regent Pryor? Here. Regent David? Regent Levy? Here. Regent May? Here. Regent Meir? Regent Seal? Regent Sterling? Here. Motion passes. All right. Thank you, members. We did discuss the c commissioner's performance using the reflections and observations provided by Dr. Reed. The, uh, the, unani the unanimous uh, comments of the board members was regarding the outstanding job she does, what of uh, incredible job she's done over the past year, traveling the state, uh, hearing the, the voices of the students, knowing the concerns of the students and the legislature and the governor and just being a, a unique person who does a unique job. And uh, we are very appreciative to have her in this state. Is there a motion to approve the evaluation of the C Commissioner of Higher Education? Is there a second? Yeah. All right, but, uh, but Mr. Me Mr. Mayor on the second. Any discussion, any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The motion does pass. Matthews or any other business to come before the personnel committee? Yes, All right.
Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> oh, let me pause. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before this, this group, this committee? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? My motion by Mr. Mayor, a second by Mr. May. Any discussion? Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. So appreciate that, Matthew. We will um, uh, make the necessary communication to move forward um, with what needs to be moved forward with. Okay. In terms of specifics, I guess. Right. We, we made some uh, recommendations as a personnel committee, and I'll bring them to the, uh, the board chair to act upon. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, guys, um, we will speed into the August Board of Regents uh, meeting. So, I call that meeting to order. Um, members, remembering that we are being streamed live, you all know that. We're going to jump down to Ms. Doreen. Doreen, you're right. I'm calling you wrong. Go ahead. Oh, okay. That's right. She had to leave. She's catching a four o'clock fight. Yeah. So, uh, Commissioner will be calling our roll. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Regent David, Regent Ewing, Here. Regent Finley, Here. Regent Levy, Regent Labrier, Here. Regent May, who's here? Regent Meir, Regent Perez, here. Regent Pryor, here. Regent Seal, Regent Sterling, here. Regent Temple, here. Regent Weil, Regent Williams Brown, here. you have a quorum. Great, great. So, um, next up, public comments. Are there any public comments? No, there are not. Hearing none, uh, I'll ask for additional public comments. I've give, I gave you a quick second. If you don't move quick, <laughs> we're on. Members, you received a copy of June 15, 2022 meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Second. Ewing, Finley, thank you very much. Motion made, seconded. Um, and any discussion, any questions, all in favor signify by saying aye. All opposed, nay. Motion passes. Um, we've obviously heard from um, uh, President Shields and uh, as well as hearing from President Gallo. Um, and so just touching on uh, AT&T and Regent, well, I guess this is, yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm there. Uh, Regent Perez, we were all proud to see the generosity of AT&T recently highlighted uh, by our partners at the uh, LCTCS system. Uh, last week, AT&T Foundation donated $40,000, you all, to LCTCS to support students seeking their fiber optic technician certification. Um, you all, uh, I got the opportunity during LCTCS, I, I don't know if that's day or whatever, but it, we had it here. Uh, they had an amazing event. They have it every year. It was, um, uh, and I got a chance literally to, uh, you know, do, go through the fiber optic, you know, uh, you know, put, putting it in the ground. It was, uh, they had a, obviously a simulator, yeah. okay. <laughs> but uh, it was an amazing experience. And uh, we all know the expansion of broad, broadband in our state is a huge priority. Uh, for those that remember, when we got a chance to go to the governor's, um, uh, the governor's uh, mansion, and eat breakfast with him that morning, he mentioned that in that meeting. I was in another meeting with him later that week and he talked about the significance uh, of broadband. And so uh, that, that fiber optic technician certification is going to be very, very beneficial. And we truly appreciate AT&T's uh, commitment to that. So ensuring Louisiana is not only ready to build these networks but maintain them with a trained and experienced workforce is critical. We've been talking about workforce development. So thank you, Regent Perez, for your leadership, obviously, at AT&T and obviously on this board, ma'am. I'd also like to make a very short note, and that is that we are only responsible for everybody. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We see you in action and recognize the standard that you are setting for employees and industry across our state, uh, Regent Perez, and uh, very much so thankful for you. Um, and then Intergy, obviously, uh, Mr. May walked out, but Regent May and Energy also recently contributed to a, a, a cause close to the heart 
of our region staff, you all, every summer during the annual staff retreat, region uh, employees participate in a summer of service project uh, supporting foster youth heading to college for the first time in the fall. Um, when they first started this project, you all, there were only 11 uh, foster youth planning to attend college in the entire state of Louisiana. Um, and this year, three times that almost 30 students have graduated from high school while in the foster care system uh, and will continue their education at a two or four year college or university. And in addition to our staff and contributions, Intergy generously pitched in $2,500 to purchase dorm items like uh, sheet sets, towels, laundry baskets, and backpacks, you all. Uh, this annual service project ensures our state's foster youth are supported and that their journey to college is going to be celebrated. Um, I'm so proud of the focus of our staff uh, and for Entergy for financial uh, boost, you know, their financial boost uh, with such an amazing and worthwhile project, you all. Um, so Entergy, in his absence, Mr. May, thank you for that. Uh, and then our student member, who we, who we all got the opportunity to see in action today. Um, and, but that's just how she is, right? So I've, I've been around her a couple of times already. And uh, Katerina, uh, uh, you know, speaking on investing in our talent, our student member has kicked off her fall semester at Delgado after a busy summer in engaging in several higher education activities, starting with attending our higher education summit dinner at LSU, uh, which she was a hit there as well. This event brought together all of Louisiana's higher education board members so that we could celebrate historic budget um, provided by the governor and legislature uh, this session and discuss our collective vision for increased attainment and prosperity in our state. Um, quite honestly, uh, uh, kind of the effort was led um, and championed by LSU's president, who uh, uh, chairman, who we actually heard from today. Um, but Katarina, I was I was so pleased that you and some of your fellow student body presidents could join us at that dinner, and uh, and then I'm just I, I love your energy and and just how you're completely engaged uh, and immerse yourself in everything that's going on with no hesitation uh, at all. So if you look at that picture. Um, uh, Regent Mir actually was standing on two risers, and it still <laughs> looked the way that it looked there. <laughs> okay. Hey. So, and look, and like, as y'all are joking, he actually made the joke before I did, okay? And he made it on social media, right? So, um, so go ahead, uh, Katarina, go, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Temple. Um, it was a great summer preparing for the upcoming year, and I appreciate the invitation to attend the Higher Education Dinner at LSU with you all and my fellow student leaders. Um, I really loved all the flowers that they had there. They were very gorgeous. I just had to take one home for myself because <laughs> they were just beautiful. Um, we also had the Monkeypox webinar earlier this week on Monday, and that was really beneficial for us to listen in and hear from our experts about the current status of the disease in Louisiana. Um, we're also going to be working closely with the Department of Health on pushing out that information to our campuses. And I'm looking forward to working with all of our institutions for the upcoming year with the Council of Student Body Presidents. Uh, we have all our meetings scheduled for the year, so I'm really excited to kick those off this fall. And during the summer, I was also taking a statistics class, and I made a B. So, you know, we did all of that while in school. Um, but thank you again. No, thank you so much, Regent. Um, you know, we know you obviously had a busy semester ahead, but we also know we'll be hearing about, um, you know, your accomplishments and activities in the months to come. So I know you'll make sure you keep us updated, and we appreciate it. Um, Next, we'll have a, a committee report, uh, vote, and uh, recommendations uh, together. So uh, if any board member, though, wishes to take this up separately, speak now, forever hold your peace. OK, there we go. All right. So, <laughs> so um, uh, but seriously, no one, we're good with that, right? In Globo, we can, we can knock it out. So um, OK, all right. So. Um, do I have a motion to approve all committee recommendations for from today's committee meetings in Globo? So moved, Mr. Chair. All right. Second? Second. Second. All right. Race for second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those oppo opposed? Nay. Motion passes.
Thank you so much. So uh, next we will move on to the recommendations by the Commissioner of Higher Education. Uh, go ahead, ma'am. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for hanging in there in a long but a very productive meeting. Uh, so first I want to uh, introduce you again and call on uh, David Spicer to share a few comments. As you know, he had a great 10-week um, tenure of, of duty with us at the Board of Regents, the Governor's Fellow. David is from Sulphur, Louisiana, and uh, shadowed with us uh, here at the Board of Regents. He is uh, at MIT, wow. and he is the SGA president at MIT. So wow. look what Sulphur, Louisiana can do. That's what I'm talking about. So uh, David, um, we asked him to share a few of, uh, comments about his uh, experience at Regents. He had a chance in the fellowship to pitch a policy to the governor, uh, to travel nationally with me and to speak on a panel and it just has been a phenomenal addition to our team. So great that he is gonna be a virtual intern with us this semester. Great. So <laughs> yes, we're, keep, we're keeping David with us. So David, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed, and it's a true pleasure to come back and sort of give you some of my highlights from this summer. Uh, so I just want to start with a little bit of an overview of my summer. So as Dr. Reed mentioned, I got to spend 10 very great weeks here at Regents uh, exploring state government behind the scenes. I've also included some of my highlight events, uh, so hopefully don't stir up any jealousy, but was really, really fortunate to uh, work with Dr. Reed and shadow her in attending a lot of these events. Uh, I started out my summer very strong going to two press conferences back to back, one at Southern uh, around the uh, Ravine Protection Project. And then the next day we were over at the fourth floor of the Capitol building around the MJ Foster program. And then throughout my summer, I also got to sit in on some task force meetings even getting to uh, speak at the dual enrollment as a student representative. One other highlight of my summer was convening all of my fellow fellows from the program uh, to here at Regents and welcoming, welcoming them into our family. Uh, and so with the great help of Dr. Allison Smith in the back, uh, we were able to convene this forum around mental health, which I'm sure as all of you know, is a really pressing issue in higher education. And as we think about student success, certainly that mental health has to be the priority of it. Luckily, in this, uh, for this forum, we were able to invite some guests from the Office of Behavioral Health. Uh, so we had Assistant Secretary Karen Stubbs, as well as her Chief of Staff, Dr. Ashley Jefferson. And so for these student leaders who are part of this fellows program, uh, it was truly a great experience to see how higher ed and how healthcare can join together to best serve students around mental health needs. As Dr. Reed uh, previewed in her introduction of me, uh, one of my highlights came at the very end of the summer when, when we together went to Washington, D.C. to present at the Reagan Institute Summit on Education. And here you can see me and my fellow student panelists. Uh, and so on this panel called Students at Work, uh, we were able to explore a gamut of issues that students are thinking about. So again, mental health. Uh, we also had a time to reflect on public service and how that has changed uh, throughout the pandemic. And digital citizenship, what does it mean to use technology wisely? How can our institutions help students uh, through digital inclusion efforts? Uh, and so this was a great event to certainly meet some of my icons in education including uh, the ninth U.S. Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, Deputy Secretary Martin, as well as making some new connections at my dinner table. Uh, and so certainly this was such a great event and such a great takeaway. On my last, last, second to last day of my fellowship, I presented a proposal to Governor Edwards around the outcomes-based funding formula. Uh, and so my proposal consisted of two components. First, it looked at adding individuals who are or were incarcerated as a equity completer group. So a way to really bring, uh, forge a bridge between that community and our institutions of higher education. And the second part of my proposal dealt with aligning workforce priorities to really support our colleges of educators, uh, college, colleges of education to support educators in the field. 
And so with that said, I know one question I got a lot from Dr. Reed towards my end is, David, what are you learning from this? What are your takeaways? So I want to share three of my top ones. Certainly, I admire Dr. Reed, your student first attitude, how you always brought students into the conversation. The word I used to describe Regents was innovation. I was so amazed sitting in these deputy commissioner calls every morning and hearing about the exciting new ideas that we're bringing here to Louisiana. And finally, relationship building. So I think both to Dr. Reed and all the Regents, I really admire your collegiality and how strong you're building up the field of higher education. And in fact, this is something I'm taking back with me to MIT, where I'm starting a leadership forum where I've already have our state officials, uh, a representative who serves on the Committee of Higher Education, uh, trying to get Michelle Wu, the mayor of Boston, to come speak to leaders on my campus. And so certainly, I think Dr. Reed, you were such a great example of what it means to connect students to leaders in the field. And I thank you for that. And so I just want to close with saying I, my connection with Regents is not over yet, uh, just moving to a virtual format. And so I'm very grateful to be working uh, with Dr. Susanna Craig this fall, hopefully doing some work around funding equity. But the fund will continue. And I just want to say thank you so much for your support at this fellowship. And Dr. Reed, thank you for a great summer. Incredibly. Incredibly pr proud of you, David, and the great work. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for continuing to work with us at Regents. As you all know, this is what we do. We invest in students and uh, learn from them and engage with them. So very well done, David. Good luck back at MIT and with us virtually. So that, that's a, a double win for us. Thank you. Uh, let's see, the next slide. Uh, so a couple of quick highlights. We had an opportunity to um, join the governor on the announcement of the gumbo grants uh, as we continue to work on um, ex uh, connecting our communities in Louisiana. We also at the time announced a digital inclusion pilot in um, five uh, regions of the state and that's a pilot with uh, libraries to ensure we have digital literacy courses. So each pilot site will receive $20,000 from the Lewis Library Network as we continue to make sure not only we have broadband, but people understand how to use it. So we're very excited about that, enjoyed that work. Can I, can I just say something? Um, uh, Commissioner, uh, the uh, private sector has engaged in doing a little bit of this, but the concern has always been that an organization with this kind of, of scope and influence really needs to engage in order for our people to, to understand what digital literacy is and why it's relevant to their lives. So I commend you for taking it on as a project with the governor. It is sorely needed all across the state. Absolutely, thank you so much. So we have digital navigators that are in each region of the state and so we will learn through this pilot how to do this statewide. That's our goal, and you're absolutely right. So we're looking forward to that. The next thing I want to do is lift up the, the training uh, opportunities that have happened over the summer, whether it's cybersecurity, disaster planning, dual enrollment, monkeypox, and COVID. We have uh, been convening various groups of colleges and university uh, individuals to focus on the kinds of trainings that we need to make sure uh, are available to prepare for a, a, a safe and successful uh, fall semester. So lots of those have happened. Kudos to all the region staff who work very hard to make sure professional development is happening uh, all across uh, our state for our campuses and universities. Next, shout out to our uh, own staff. Uh, four of them had an opportunity to really shine at the National SHEO Conference. Presentations were um, selected um, and so there was a competition for who would be selected to present at the national conference. And so you see four uh, of our staff who are at, on the stage. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, Dr. Craig, uh, uh, Dr. Vosper, uh, Carrie Robeson, and Matthew Labriere talked about uh, formula, prison education, faculty diversity, outcomes-based funding, and more. So very proud of that team. Um, and then finally, I had an opportunity to um, do an armchair conversation with the U.S. Secretary of Education um, during their first. God, she's playing it down. She's playing it down. She's 
she was asked to be the person to lead and communicate and interview the head of education for the United States. Uh, but he as they asked her, I don't know if it was him or if it was his team, okay? So I just had to add that because she was just going to keep going like <laughs> it was a regular situation. Yes, I was. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it was an honor to sit with the U.S. Secretary of Education in a room of educators from across the country uh, talking about the major issues facing higher education today, affordability, social mobility, um, teacher preparation and recruitment, a number of things. So we've turned that conversation into um, a podcast. And so, as you know, we continue to do podcasts on topics that are important. And so more to come on that, but we'll make sure to share that with you. Um, and with that, I do want to also say thank you to this board um, and the representatives from the um, other systems as well for a great policy conversation, for continuing to put students first and continuing to focus on, on advancing our talent development in Louisiana. Just really grateful uh, for the opportunity. So with that, Mr. Chair, back to you. Okay, so is there, thank you for that report. Uh, yes, sir, Regent to, uh, Pryor. Uh, in this meeting, uh, I wanted to note Wendy Palermo from the nursing board, I believe LCTS nursing, she conducted a all schools of Northwest Louisiana first of its kind nursing summit for the public and was held at Bossier Parish, uh, Bossier Parish Community College and all the nursing programs uh, came and participated and kids, uh, high school students came from all around and the title was, So You Want to Be a Nurse? And they put this together in a month from our last board meeting when I was wow. talking about the lack of, of nurses in North Louisiana. So I wanted to applaud her publicly for putting that together. And I would encourage all of you to uh, get with them and do one in your community for the high school students and college students showed up, including a football player from Louisiana Tech showed up and wants, wants to be a, how to be a nurse. So thank you. That's great. That's phenomenal. And that's what we need, people taking charge and, uh, and making things happen. And just like that event was put together that pulled people from, from, from all the state uh, together, that's why. I believe we can do what you're talking about in that same period of time, okay? So we'll make sure we get that taken care of. Uh, so is there any other business to come before this board? Members, we will see you again next month on September 20th for budget hearings and our board meeting on September 21st. Um, do we have any public comments? No. Hearing none. <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn? Moved, seconded, any discussion, any questions? All those in uh, favor, aye, opposed, nay. Motion passes, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, y'all be safe. Yeah. Law school. No. And we out. Doctor, special anesthesiology. No, this is my friend's daughter here. Huh?